Did it mean?
Uh, good morning, delegates. Uh, today is the 30th of May, 2022. The Speaker of the Free State Legislature has decided to convene the inaugural Workers' Parliament, uh, which will be a platform to the sector for the sector to come and discuss issues that are directly and indirectly affecting the workers at the workplace. My name is Lazimo Khodzi, I'm the acting deputy secretary. The speaker has mandated me just to assist with a, to be a program director for the day. The deputy speaker will be here to come and do proper welcoming and the speaker will do the keynote address. Before we could go to formal proceedings, it is going to be very important that we must adhere to our COVID-19 protocols and precautionary measures. I think we all know that even though we are no more using the Disaster Management Act, it is important that we must be cautious and not drop the ball because COVID is still with us. So we'll be requesting that at all material times, let us ensure that we'll be wearing the masks. Though we are not complying 100% to the social distancing, but you can see that our seating arrangement to a certain extent does respond to the social distancing. In the process, I'm sure all of us, when we arrived there, when we arrived here, we were able to pass through our sanitization station so that we sanitize. So let us just remain and adhere to those protocols. I don't want to disrupt the proceedings when it has started in terms of coming up with certain rules that will be regulating our engagement. So it is going to be very important that before we start, we just clear certain rules that we think that they are important to ensure that our event becomes successful. Uh, I will not be touching on what the speaker will be saying and also to the program, I will be doing the program outline a little bit later. Uh, just to ensure that we are going to have a smooth event and also to ensure that our engagement will be properly maintained there are certain rules that I'm going to request that we observe during the day. One of them is that we all know that our cell phones must be off. If we've got uh, some engagement that we still have to do telephonically, it is going to be important that we request all of you just to, to put them on a silent mode. Uh, if you, they are not, you are not going to be that busy it won't be wrong on our own speaker if they can dismantle it and then put them in their, in, their, in their bags. So that's the first rule that I'm going to request that we observe. The second one will be that we are not going to allow a lot of movement inside the chamber when the proceedings uh, started. So it's going to be important that if you've got something that you want to go and do outside, just stand up quietly and then exit the chamber and then come back the same manner. The other thing is that uh, at the time when the proceedings are taking place, when a delegate is on the podium delivering the speech, we are going to request that uh, he or she must not be disrupted. We will just allow them to do their presentation. Uh, the other one, No delegate will be addressing another delegate. We will request that anything that is being said here, it must be said through the chair, so that the chair can be able to maintain order of proceedings. The last one, we are going to request that we don't use offensive or unbecoming language when we do our presentation. We know that by the very nature, union members are radical. So on this one, we are just going to request that you tone down the, the voice and the, the message must be clear. And then 
I'm sure I will allow certain things to be addressed by the Honorable Speaker when she does a keynote address. And then if there are those that she won't be touching on in between as the program director, I'll just keep on throw them in so that we have an order uh, in the house. So those were the rules that I wanted us to agree on so that we, as and when we move forward, we know that uh, our proceedings will go as smooth as all of us will want. Uh, I'll be outlining our program for the day. Uh, we will be allowing the our Honorable Deputy Speaker, Mema Pena, when she does the welcoming, she can even request the House to observe a moment of silence because everything will be on a watch. And then uh, after the Honorable Deputy Speaker has done the welcoming, she will then introduce to our speaker who will be doing the keynote address. After that, we will be giving an opportunity to our MEC for Finance, Honorable Brown, just to come and do the presentation on the role of the free state government in the current economic landscape and the labor market. And then immediately after her, we will then go to yourself as the main actors and active participant in this activity. We will be starting with the COSADU, with their presentation on the thematic topic that has been agreed upon, which is the state of collective bargaining transformation and broad challenges faced by workers in the workplace. So after the presentation by COSACTU representative, we are going to have a 30 minutes inputs that we'll be expecting from COSACTU affiliates. Then immediately we will manage the time. We've got 30 minutes, but we'll be allowing affiliates just to give the inputs on the topic. We will just uh, be able to manage the 30 minutes time. So, and uh, we agreed with the Secretariat, our leadership from the two federations, that when a member or a delegate is on the platform, because this is your day, we are not going to interrupt you. Even if we can say you can speak for two or three minutes, if you are still continuing, we are not going to stop you. But what we are going to request again to you, delegates, is that uh, let us not do repetition. Speaker will explain the process what is going to happen after this event. So the reason for us not to want a repetition, it is because we want to be able to craft the recommendation that will be smart so that at the time when they are being communicated with the executive, at least we know that we've got smart resolutions that must be implemented by the executive. The very same procedure will be followed when we go to SAFTU where SAFTU representative will also be doing the presentation and then we'll also be allowing SAFTU affiliates to also input on the topic. Fortunately, we've got one topic. We just wanted to get the inputs from that. And then after those presentations and the inputs, we will then be reverting to the MEC for Finance who will just be doing the remarks on the inputs that we have made. And then the speaker will then do the closing remarks and vote of thanks and then we will break for lunch. So that is how our program is going to unfold uh, delegates. So I will be allowing now the uh, deputy speaker uh, to do the welcoming, and then uh, observe, uh, firstly we must observe the moment of silence because we are a secular state. In the past we knew that we were going to request one of you to just do a prayer, but because we are a secular state, then you just observe the moment of silence, but I'm going to request the Deputy Speaker to be the one who will be presiding over that one. Deputy Speaker. Thank you very much, Tatelaz. Uh, I think as and when we observe the moment of silence, I will request that we stand up just to do that. <laughs> Thank you very much. You may be seated. 
Dr. Lazi, thank you for the opportunity. To the Honorable Speaker, <coughs> Ms. Anneli Sifuba, and the Premier in her absentia, Honorable Maleleki, the Deputy Chief Whip, Honorable Brown, and you, Basebets. Dr. Lazi, when, when I was invited here, I was, I, I was happy. I But I still miss it. But hey, we are in Parliament, I understand. But I understand. But it's how to keep us very well. Now, can let me just stand up and come and 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 come and respect you. Just have a little hold on. I can Amanda, Amanda, Macha, Karuna, all power. Jalebo. Must be to work. I can feel like it too. Today more. But Honorable Speaker, let me do this before I do that. For those who doesn't know me, Luisa Lakaki Lucy Nombule Loma Pena, the former shop steward, Yane who served before 1994, up until 2014, I could resign the And then I ended up killing. Kosatu Kili a provincial agenda chairperson, Koya Kosatu, before 2014 when I came to the parliament. Kitsolo Hachukan, Kilitola and Abloufuntain, Kamasabis Nikisabisa Orange Hospital, which is now known as Frisid Psychiatry Complex. That is a long and short or now who is the deputy speaker today here standing here. Uh, today I'm going to call you honorable members as I used to when I'm standing here. Hakikoli Biza Makom. Katsebala Makomo, your comrades. But today I'm going to give you the name of honorable members. Uh, amongst us, we are having two federations, which is SAFTU. Uh, the SAFTU, the interim provincial uh, structure, which is led by Felicity Lechet Le Amohitsu. We are also having COSATU. COSATU is the Federation Leona, which is led by Ntatemunyatso Mahlatsi Le Amohitsu Le Amohitsu Le The the unions that are amongst us here that I also want to acknowledge is the NOSA. You are welcome, the NOSA. We are having. Yeah, that is my friend. You to say that we are not going to be able to when we were still saving. <laughs> uh, we are also having IAWU. I'm not sure now if I lose some, but it's about the post. But you are also welcome. We are also having FAU. FAU is the is amongst ourselves. You are welcome. We are having NUMSA. NUMSA, uh, uh, you, are, you, are, you are welcome uh, 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 in this August house. We are having SADU. SADU, you are also welcome. We are having DETAU. The town, you are also welcome. We are also having Napsa. I hope to be the hand or can Napsau Napsau Nunso. Okay, okay, no, terrible. You are also welcome, uh, honorable members. Uh, we are also having Salipswa. Keep it hand. Salip, so you are welcome. Uh, we are also having Sakau, 
in our midst. Uh, I hope I've also I've also welcomed the Samu and then Pop Crew. You are also welcome Nehau Mokinyatse Mokinyansen thing. You are also welcome. Amongst our mixed Hakitats or who the you know that that are amongst ourselves. We are also having old Mushwan amongst ourselves. Old Mushwan, we are welcome. And then we are also having the media. The Amahili Hilibatodibak, you are welcome. You can relax. The Serafasi said in Chatarna Zarata legislature, uh, you, you can participate with the rules that are, are, are already uh, 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 been set. Uh, I hope you are going to enjoy your, yourself today. And don't remember, don't, don't forget, today you are not comrades, and whilst you are here, you are honorable members. Thank you very much. Honorable Deputy Speaker, can they just introduce the speaker so that the speaker can do the keynote address? Honourable members, uh, let me take this opportunity and, 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 and present to you our Honourable Speaker of the Free State Legislature to come and address you, uh, the Honourable Speaker of the Legislature, Ms. Anneli Sifuba. Uh, Ms. Anneli Sifuba Liene, she's also from the Trade Union, she's from SATU, she will come and do what is expected from here. Thank you very much. Over to you, Speaker. Uh, thank you, Honorable Deputy Speaker. Uh, Program Director, thank you. I know that uh, standing here, one has to be careful, but I cannot miss the opportunity to say uh, workers of the world unite, you've got nothing to use but your chains. Honorable Deputy Speaker, I acknowledge you, Honorable Mayor Lucy Mapene, Deputy Chief Whip of the Legislature, Honorable Saram Leleki. MEC for Finance, Honorable Khadija Brown, the Provincial Deputy General Secretary of SATU, Ndate uh, Jihad I was told he's here, the Provincial Secretary of COSATU, Ndate Munyazo Mathazi, Provincial Deputy Secretary of SAFTU, Me Felicity Lichete. Chairpersons and provincial secretaries and leadership of all the affiliates from the two federations present, I can see uh, 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 provincial secretaries, I can see the chairpersons, the faces that I know. I acknowledge you. The leadership of the federation at large, two federations, the shop stewards amongst us, you are welcome and good morning. It is with great pleasure that I welcome you today to this inaugural workers' parliament. We know that it has not been easy to organize because of the tight schedules of the unions in the sector itself. Workers have been busy. We, are, we, are, we however, appreciate that all stakeholders have been very willing to engage and agree that we should hold this workers' parliament on this day. In actual fact, we had wanted to start this sectoral engagement in 2020. 
Unfortunately, COVID-19 came and disrupted all the programs that we envisaged to pursue. It is always a very good show of unity and of purpose when issue is handled with more sensitivity. This eventual realization of this inaugural workers' parliament must be understood as a catalyst for future engagements and deliberations between all stakeholders. This means that we must not lose hope and we must continue to engage even those federations that are not here with us today. Hence, I started with the phrase that says, workers of the world unite, you've got nothing to lose but your chains. Maybe to briefly outline the role and the function of the legislature as outlined in the Constitution, so that we understand why it is important to have you today as a sector. In terms of the Constitution, a parliament or legislature is responsible for making laws. It is responsible for public participation and education and conducting oversight on the executive arm of the state and other state organs. It becomes critical, therefore, for us to have these sectoral parliaments and dialogues in order to monitor the execution of the law this sectoral, uh, 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 by the executive arm of the state. It becomes critical, therefore, for us to have these sectoral parliaments and dialogues in order to monitor the execution of the law by the executive arm of the state, because that is what the executive is responsible for and allow the public to discuss. It is also important to keep an eye on the execution of the law that we make. As the legislature, we are the custodian of the law, and some of these laws have to be implemented outside government itself. Workers' Parliament, like other sectoral parliament, is an important platform for us as legislature and as a law-making institution. These platforms always serve as a critical mechanism to collect feedback and to monitor the, effect, the effectiveness and efficiency of all legislation. Yes, we have established a very cordial relationship wherein we use these platforms to allow the executive to physically respond to the issues raised. We can say with confidence that we make good progress in this regard and we intend, we intend to make momentum. So it's not going to be just a talk show here. At the end of the day, issues that we lift from this, uh, out of this process, we have to go and engage whoever needs to be engaged for a positive response so that we don't annually meet here only to find out when we meet the following year, we are still hammering on the issues that were raised without affecting the workers, working class and the poor and the key object of maintaining labor peace. By maintaining labor peace, all stakeholders the safe working conditions that are developmental and enriching to all. Ensuring stability within working environment is also good in building better communities. Our communities respond better to institutions that project strong labor peace and sense of stability. In this way, we stand a good chance of building active citizenry with strong sense of understanding of government mandate. Workers, therefore, are involved in a very aspect of life and thus their observations are often the most advanced of all sectors. If it is, if it is for this reason, it is for this reason that we felt that no matter the challenges surrounding the coordination of this event, we are forging ahead. Ladies and gentlemen, we also meet here today as we conclude the Africa Day 
which is a very important day to us as Africans. As you remember, we are celebrating Africa Day because of the 25th of May 1963, when the countries, after breaking away from uh, colonization, met and decided to launch a, a, a platform that they are going to use in order to advance the needs of the people of Africa. But that time, it was OAU, Organization uh, 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 for African Unity. We, also launch, we have also launched as the legislature the Common Parliamentary Association of the Free State Branch. The launch was a culmination of a long process of international relations work led by national parliament and legislatures. We intend to use this platform to continue the work that has been championed by our government and various federations through the International Labour Organization. We believe that using CPA platform will allow best practices and give more meaning to various conventions adopted at international level and ratified by our countries. Our African region CPA and other platforms also help us to forge strong relations with our counterparts at the continental level. Our countries are now experiencing a greater movement of people due to different reasons, but in the main, it is people seeking a better life. This situation increases the strain on individual countries' economies and increases uncertainties in the abilities of the countries to defend the interests of its citizens, but also of the rights of migrants and workers in general. We are celebrating the Workers' Month as part of the International Workers' Month as many successes we have achieved as a country. The establishment of a very strong workers' organizations, employers' organizations, and a very solid collective bargaining regime are some of the work we must always celebrate. The Labor Relations Act, of 19, Act 66 of 1995, Basic Conditions of Employment Act 75 of 1997, are some of the milestones of workers' achievements in their many years of struggle. Having strong institutions such as the Commission for Conciliation, Mediation and Arbitration, the Regional Appeals Committee and the Department of Labor and the Labor Inspectorate are but a few indications of the immense work that needs to be celebrated in this month. The challenges of the changing world of work being influenced by issues, issues such as the fourth industrial revolution, the accentuation world economy and the now COVID-19 pandemic affect the workers directly. It is also the workers who, who are our hope to find lasting solutions to all these challenges. Already, our workers have proven that they have a very strong, strong sense of adaptation to new conditions and change. More and more of the solutions we have in our different organizations and sectors today are the tireless work of innovations by workers. Therefore, as much as we believe strongly in building strong organizations that take care of your well-being, therefore, as much as we believe strong in building strong organizations that take care of the well-being of the employer's interest, as it is with the interest of the workers themselves. As we open this session of the Workers' Parliament, we take the opportunity to celebrate and honor the mass democratic movement in the war against apartheid, which was characterized by the exploitation of workers and the working class. The apartheid system denied the workers all their right and made it difficult for women to become equal participants in the building of our country and the economy. At the same time, the apartheid system encouraged la child labor and super exploitation as mentioned before. 
While there are many challenges we still need to confront, we stand to appreciate and honor you, the worker, for the contribution you have made in shaping the government to have a constitution that consists of the Bill of Rights, which is also sensitive to the welfare of workers. This must be understood in the context of our country having had a very strong movement generally from the working class in order, in order to advance and pursue these struggles. Today, these many successes have become a norm. Most of our people do not understand that the eight-hour working period was worn through sweat and blood of the workers. There is today more and more flexibility in their work schedules, allowing organizations and workers to accomplish target complexity. It is now a requirement in law that workers are required to take regular leave days and there is more control on free time. Ladies and gentlemen, for this and all other progress rights, rather progressive rights and democratic gains, we intend to keep the flag flying high. It is our hope that our work will continue to encourage individuals to do their most. Not just to work, but to become a worker all round. Honorable delegates, with these few words, I thank you. May the deliberation be of great value to the workers of the world. Thank you, Prodem Director. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Speaker, and uh, also to you, Deputy Speaker, for the items that we have just concluded now. Uh, speaker did mention that uh, the constitutional mandate of the legislature are actually to make laws, to oversight, to, to uh, conduct oversight over the executive, as well as to facilitate public access and participation in the business of the legislature. So for us to be able to respond to one of those uh, constitutional mandates, we would like to inform the House that uh, this session is live streamed. So anyone who wants to access it can just go to uh, Free State Legislature Facebook and YouTube, and then uh, delegates are also encouraged to inform their members just to link so that they can be able to view the proceedings of the House. Uh, we will then go to the presentations as per our program. Uh, the first one then will go to the Honorable MEC for Finance, Honorable Mayor Brown. Mayor Brown, the, the stage is yours. Thank you. Kia Liboa. Kia Liboa. Thank you, Program Director. Allow me to kindly acknowledge the Honorable Speaker, Ms. Danile Sifuba, our Honorable Premier in our absence, Ms. Sisi Ntombela, Honorable Deputy Speaker, Ms. Lucy Mapena, Honorable Chief Whip, Ms. Sara Mulileki, Deputy Secretary General of SAFTU from a national level, Jihad Sion Sionia, uh, Provincial Secretary of Kosatu in the province, Ndati Mahlatsi. Provincial Deputy Secretary of SAFTU in the province, Mayor Felicity. Leadership of the Federations present. Leadership and members of unions across the province. Comrades, ladies and gentlemen, Amandla. <coughs> Honorable Program Director and Speaker, whilst I'm in this house, I refer to the Honorable Speaker, there are such strict rules. So today we are referring to the Honourable Programme Director, but allow me, Honourable Speaker, to thank you for the invitation to present the role of the Free State Government in the current economic landscape and labour market on behalf of the Free State Government. It is important as part of our roles and responsibilities is to strengthen our social compact as a government 
And that means is to strengthen stakeholder relationships between government, industry, business, labor, and civil society. Honorable Speaker, as we stand here and be reminded during Workers' Month that the COVID-19 pandemic hit South Africa at a time when its economic vulnerabilities had already been aggravated by a prolonged period of depressed investment, subdued growth, and high and rising public debt. In this context, the country suffered one of the largest output contradictions amongst emerging markets and those economies in 2020, those social contradictions already strained by stubbornly high poverty rates, unemployment and inequality, which worsened further the education system, the job losses, which was disproportionate and affected youth, women and the poor in our country. A significant loss of jobs has been recorded during that period, taking the unemployment rate to a record of high unemployment levels. The Free State Government's leadership reacted swiftly to the pandemic's fallout by providing cash support and unemployment protection. So how did we do that, Honourable Speaker, as a province? The province used to have a 600 million rand overdraft since 2011. In 2019, we declined that overdraft and we started building reserves. How did we build the reserves? We invested our cash in the reserve bank and in banks and we received interest income. And in order to reserve those cash and present interest income, it allowed us to deal with that support on unemployment. Furthermore, at a national level, the President placed the President Employment Package, both in the Department of Health and the Department of Education, which allowed close to just a half a billion rands worth of funding on the President Employment Package across the three terms to be able to stimulate short-term employment for the province. Speaker, the pandemic has also highlighted the crucial need to put our, our trajectory and the province public finances in order to, to reverse the upward public debt trajectory. So as a province, we had to ensure that we consolidate, we reduce our debt, and we re reverse the, the public debt within the province. And we also looked at reducing financing cost. We increased market confidence by attracting certain investments and we improve the quality of public expenditure to make room for further investment on infrastructure, basic services, and, and other matters that recorded some of the challenges that we, we required for social support. Speaker and program director, there were various businesses at various levels that were affected during this national lockdown. Specifically in the events, management industry, in the tourism industry, in the industries that were affected mostly by social distancing. And these were industries at the time that were not regarded as providing social services. They, on, on the other hand, they also affected supply chain disruptions. So the ability for us to take goods to market and to ensure reliance and updated services within the public sector, those had also been disrupted during the time of the pandemic. The telecommunication sector, the selected mining activities uh, were due to decrease in demand of minerals across the trade environments and accommodation tourism that requires requirements due to travel bans, construction, transport, and various other services. Allow me to say, members and program director, that the impact of the pandemic on the economy depended highly on information related to facts at the time. And that facts were provided by business people, were provided by industry, and were provided by the market to understand those services they, that were conducted by Stats SA to provide us with the correct indices and economic analysis to determine the way we budgeted, to determine the economic effects, to determine how we would necessarily deal with policy related to the challenges that we had required during the time. On workforce implications 
uh, Honourable Programme Director, the full impact of COVID unemployment will be determined over time, but we can see the direct loss now, right now. We will only see the full impact maybe two, three years from now. And that is very, very scary. And that is the reason why we are so happy that we're having this conversation today. Because it is up to us to be proactive in determining how we will address those matters prior to it being, being uh, communicated. So, employment tends to be lagging in terms of how we deal with the analysis, but the real feel, the tangible matters are being f felt and seen as we work through our conditions and our processes currently. So if we can look at the current national fiscal environment, the current global outlook and the provincial outlook to determine how we regulate and how we um, indeed deal with those issues as we go forward in this topic of discussion today. So first and foremost, at a national fiscal environment, our debt to GDP is currently at 69.9%. Uh, sorry, 69.9, .9, meaning that there is a de deficit of revenue and expenditure of 15.9%. So currently, if we just put that in layman's terms, national government is spending 15.9% more than we are collecting. And that's overall, overall budget. Local government, provincial government, national government, we're talking about industry, business, and all those aspects that fill and filter in to national expenditure and national revenue. We're also looking at debt service costs with interest expenditure, which continue to climb, and we are expected to average 333.4 billion rand a year over the medium term. That is one of the largest expenditure items on a national budget on, on expenditure even greater than the highest expenditure item which is SAPs and defense. 333.4 billion rand. Now our role is to reduce that debt to GDP. That is our role and how are we going to do that is to create a conducive environment for the economy to grow so we can generate more employment, we can generate further individuals to increase money flow into the system, generate more taxes so that we can generate more revenue at a national, provincial and local level. But how does the macro environment affect what it is that we plan to do? And we can only understand that by understanding the global macro economy. So, Honourable Programme Director and Speaker, if we look at a broad overview of the global economic growth in 2022, it shows that it's weaker than expected in terms of growth rate globally. All countries, even your mega countries. And this is maybe due to the high transmissibility of a less uh, fatal variant of, of the pandemic, rising energy prices, notably oil, of course, the Ukraine-Russian conflict that we're currently seeing, the US-China trade tension continues to become more tense, a persistent global supply chain disruption is still continuing with the lagging effect and the multiplier effect to global and, and, and domestic economies. The cumulative effect of these unanticipated emerging shocks on global growth has led, of course, to tight financial con conditions and high inflations across advanced and emerging and developing economies and creating a tight financial um, and fiscal condition and of course spinning in domestic currencies as well. So trade on currencies, trade on commodities, the ability to look at our trade balances as a country and, and the globe and the traditional way of trade has to change in order to affect the way we think about um, our domestic economy and our domestic growth. It is worth noting, program director, that there is a positive growth outlook which is predicted for many economies in 2023. And as the disruption of the global supply chain is anticipated to have eased somewhat, while COVID-19 becomes less contagious amongst communities, 
possibly due to herd immunity as well as increased vaccines, which in effect allows broader movements and cross-border movements, for example, the tourism, the hospitality, trade and other services have now been able to open and somewhat um, start functioning at a level that is not necessarily aligned to what um, the projections were looking but somewhat open at this point. So as mentioned before, higher inflation is anticipated across the globe and we've seen it in South Africa in terms of the inflation rates that have just increased. An average of 3.9% in advanced economies and 5.9% in emerging economies and emerging markets and developing economies at the end of 2022 and 2023. And then before that, though, it will subs subside to 2.1% and 4.7% respectively in the end of 2023. Um, we should also mention that a less accommodative monetary policy in the US may lead to tighter global financial consolidation and conditions through the Federal Reserve. And while it's raised its historically low interest rate, forcing reserve banks and financial institutions across the globe to raise domestic interests and also pr put pressure on domestic currencies in our emerging economies, it would also mean that higher interest rates will raise the cost of borrowing and financing in the world capital markets, putting more constraint on public finances. Comrades, what about digital currencies? How is that going to affect our financing, our interest rates, our cost to borrowing, our leveraging of financing? What is the effect on that? And that is something that we should also, from a technology and innovation perspective, understand how it's going to affect the financial markets. The further geopolitical tension remains a downside to risk and global growth. And we're also seeing that the gas supply for US, Britain, France, European Union, Canada and Australia have also affected not only the challenging prices of oil in South Africa, but now it's topped over a barrel, barrel of 100 US dollars since, for the first time since 2014. And absolutely that is going to affect the labor market. On the domestic outlook, Honorable Program Director, Honorable Speaker, the restraint placed on the growth of the South African economy by COVID-19 over the past years has absolutely exacerbated the social economic challenges of our country. Just to mention that other elements and aspects have also further increased that. Unemployment, poverty, we are notably the first number one country in the world for the gap between the richest and the poor. So rising inflation, disruptive social unrest, varying structural issues that associate with growing gross government debts, load shedding, the effects that it has on our productive sectors, business, our aging infrastructure, failing public entities and bargaining public wage bill are all aspects that are affecting or affecting the way we derive policy or the way we thought we had to derive policy and drive investment and growth in this province, in this country over the past three years going into the next three years. So as we put all of that together as, as a problem statement, when we put together our national uh, budget vote, as we put together our provincial budget vote, and as we deal with budget lechotlas within government, we had to consider the role of public sector, the, the role of the private sector, the role of industry, the role of foreign investment, and the role of labor in what it is that we do with every cent that we spend. National Treasury also further predicted that the economy would slow down to 2.2 percent with a further decline to 1.6 percent in 2023. Now it is up to us to determine that trajectory. Are we going to allow for the predictions based on what currently has happened with the socio-economic challenges that we have 
Would we allow that to happen based on our current socio-economic environment? And further to that, the, the gain from the rising commodity prices and the social unrest that we experienced in 2021 uh, the floods that we've experienced in KZN and also the disasters that has happened in parts of the Free State and parts of, of the Eastern Cape has also diverted our attention and our focus on a fiscal level to those other aspects, which is dealing with some of our producti productivity, some of our growth baselines, some of our plans and some of our policies on employment growth. The labor market and the available unemployment data in the quarterly labor force survey report reveals that the unemployment rate increased by 0 0.5 percentage points to 34.9 percent in the third quarter of 2021 from 34.4 percent in the second quarter of 2021 which was the highest unemployment rate recorded for south africa since the beginning of the labor service market uh, survey in 2008 quarterly labor force service um, survey since 2008. While the expanded unemployment rate grew by 2.2 percent points to 48.6 percent in the third quarter of 2021. At a sectoral level, unemployment declined, and I'm going to give you values, 571,000 people, 5.6 percent in the formal sector, so we, we lost 571,000 jobs in the formal sector, by 65,000 in the private household sector, which accounts to 5.4 percent, 32,000 in the agricultural sector, which is 3.8 percent, in the third quarter of 2021. Still employment in the informal sector increased by 9,000 which is very small in comparison to the numbers that I've just outlined, 0.3% in the third quarter of 2021. Overall significant job losses were recorded across all industries between the second and third quarters of 2021, except for the finance sector industry, which gained 138,000 jobs. The annual inflation rate in South Africa rose to 5.9% in December, which prompted the South African Reserve Bank to raise interest by 25 basis points. And this contradictory policy stance caused a marginal reduction in the inflation rate of 5.7% in January 2022. And you know our current target is still 6%. So on the latest uh, Monetary Policy Committee statement that was released, um, in January this year, it affirms an expected average inflation of 4.9% for 2022. Um, after, of course, inflation averaged 4.5% in 2021, and of course, with those rising oil fuel prices, the contradictory matters, the service and electri electricity costs, it is anticipated that inflation rate will only move below 5% towards the second half of this year. On the province, Honorable Speaker and Program Director, free state economy was already in recession in 2018 and 2019 and declining by an average of 0.4% in the period under that review, in that period. And the pandemic was to shrink the provincial economy by a negative 7.2% in 2020. The rapid rollout of the vaccines has at least strengthened our ability uh, to deal with the economic performance as, at a positive level. So we boosted business confidence and investment and ensured that there was, there was no going back down to those hard lockdowns. We're seeing now in this year that we're opening for Makufe, we're opening for more events happening in the province. And although it is not at the level that we anticipate it to be, it is somewhat assisting small businesses to come back in the events, tourism, uh, supply chain and distribution industries. We are still confronted by increasing variants and uh, we do project the economy as a province to grow on an average annual growth rate of 1.8% from 2021 to 2025. With this level of growth, we, the province will not be able to fast track 
and fight against unemployment as we would wish to. Um, so we're still dependent on the national policy agreement on the presidential employment package. We're still very dependent on national um, interventions with regards to those short-term employments until the economy stabilizes and until we can get our sectors back to its trajectories in terms of their growth and sectoral growth. A continued weak economic growth has also translated into poor labor market outcomes and we're going to have to face that. An unemployment rate in the province has increased, and I can give it to you in real terms, um, in terms of the labor market survey in quarter two of 2021, from 36.5 percent to 38.1 percent in quarter three of 2021. The economically active labor force was also decreasing by 17 percent between quarter two of 2021 and quarter three of 2021, whilst on the other hand there was a slight increase in the to total labor force fueled by new entrants into the market, which is mostly youth, and that is more on your innovation sectors. And that is your digital um, environments, your technology, and some of the innovation, which is not necessarily recorded um, by Stats SA within the generic uh, sectoral um, and economic indices. So given this weak economic outlook, it spurred the province to look at some solutions. And this was consulted, we went through public participation, we did some work. And I think it, it is a baseline for job creation and job drivers, but we're going to have to find ways of implement, implementing faster and providing guidance faster, specifically from the, the uh, audience that we're speaking to today. Largely, when we talk about um, some of the solutions, we also talk about efficiencies. Um, we hear effectiveness and efficiency, and that is really optimizing HR together with other resources and ensuring that we get the best productivity out of our markets. But as we look at those solutions, let look, let's look at the business industry and sectoral uh, environment, and then we can discuss labor. So some of the solutions within our span of control as a province is pr to prioritize local procurement to assist local businesses to participate fully in value chains and enable them to employ more local people in line with the Free State Provincial Growth and Development Strategy. So how have we done that? We've requested that as we deal with the program management and project management of infrastructure projects, we're asking that project managers together with consultants and those in the industry to deliver projects on time and on budget. And furthermore, projects that are delivered within a local municipality have to deal with the uptake of local labor. That is some of the specifications that we've placed on any new tender that deals with infrastructure projects going forward as a province. Um, as mentioned, procurement of local businesses. So what we've done, as an example, in the infrastructure environment, we've allocated projects to various uh, districts. And for example, off my head, Mangahoon received 36% of the total value of infrastructure projects, Fezile Dabi, 20%, Tabu Futsaniana, 19%, Lejwe Laputswa, I think it was 16%, and Karib District, 7%. In the past, it was much more distorted. It was much more, uh, we, we found Mangaun receiving close to 36% of total projects and Karib District receiving 3%. And our argument over the previous years was we, as a government, we are crea creating a distorted and skewed economy. We're driving areas of multiply effects in bigger areas of our districts and our economy. And in the smaller rural areas, we're keeping them rural by generating and providing lesser budgets to those rural areas and we've asked that we consciously address those matters. And that then also deals with the labor environment within those various district economies. And we trust that the um, district development model will help us be able to bring up and, and, and deliver some of the labor issues when it comes to projects at that level as well. And furthermore, our call as a province is to state to local governments that even though province is 
investing in your district and in your local government, we would like that local government also through their MIG and conditional grants and other grants that they receive from national, they augment those type of investments and deal with the same principles of locals first to be able to augment some of those poverty and employment challenges that we are receiving. Supporting local SMMEs and what we're doing as a treasury and as economic development. Economic development is, is assisting with the opportunity base. So they deal with creating the opportunities and incubator, servicing the SMME market to assist them with um, funding, grant support, uh, sometimes stock, other times equipment, and, and some other type of po programs and policies that they're dealing with. But as treasury, we support the province at every level, at every corner of this province. In, if anybody's got issues with compliance, they can deal with somebody called Linda Riddles at, at um, Treasury or Tepo Mabilo. And this team goes out every quarter to every part of this province through every district by helping CSDs, tax compliant issues, tender compliant issues. If there are issues on BAS, Logos, whatever it may be, just to ensure that your local SMMEs understand. Even if at a municipality level, if you are providing catering, make sure that you can provide an invoice that is got tax compliant so that you can be on CSD so that that municipality can pay for that catering. And that municipality is not complied to deal with cash and petty cash, which is irregular. They need to go through a process and make sure that it's done correctly. We also provide agricultural support because we saw that was one of the sectors that were highly affected by the pandemic. We also provide tourism support um, and both in that environment we're looking at the, those emerging economies in those sectors, those emerging farmers, em emerging BNBs. Um, we're also looking at uh, the value chain within the agricultural uh, supply chain and preferential procurement to favour black uh, individuals and QSEs and EMEs in that market. And we also improve the supporting of e-governance, but mostly technology. And I think it's something that we should discuss as labor because skilling individuals within organizations both in the public and private sector we are leaning towards competing at a global environment and at a global sense and technology and the use of technology and the ability to bring product to market at the most efficient um, ways through technology is one of the high key drivers and it's important for our labor uh, um, a pool of labor to understand how to to be skilled and reskilled in that pardon in that environment to remain competitive but speak a part of both the, the state of the province address and the provincial budget vote. The system of this economy needs to change, uh, and specifically in this province. And part of our discussions at a broad level was drivers. And I'm going to raise issues that is going to spark debate, and we, we will have a robust discussion about it. So what we need to do like I said, as a, as a government, create this conducive environment. But what are those drivers to create that environment? Firstly, it's water. You cannot have an industry, you cannot be dealing with production or manufacturing if you don't have regular water supply. So just to give you historic figures, in 1994, only 51% of the South African population had access to clean drinking water. In 2020, the South African government increased that figure to 88.6%. And we do, comrades, program director, honorable speaker, we do have grants in the system at a national, provincial, and local level to deal with our water challenges. Kwakwa is one example. Putting a temporary borehole, putting in uh, pumps, uh, there's this water, water projects that are happening in Kwakwa, but the management is not very good, honorable speaker. You have a management of a water plant. It's been locked. You, you go there to do oversight. You ask for the key. The person who is supposed to be there is not there. The lock is rusted. You can see that place hasn't been open for more than six to eight to even a year. And those are the stuff that we, as, as provincial government, when we do our oversight, 
is asking those questions at a municipal level because we perhaps do these projects at a national level and we transfer, transfer it to the municipalities for municipal management and we ask the municipality, where is your security? Where is the person, that's a technician that's supposed to look after this water plant? Why hasn't it been serviced over the year? And we, we, we wait for answers. Now it is that type of management that we must bring in. So the solutions are there. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got the budget. There are municipal infrastructure grants that can deal with water. We've got the National Department of Water and Sanitation. We do know that we've got maintenance costs that has resulted to the pre-apartheid challenges that we've had, where certain water infrastructures were provided to certain parts of this country and left like it was, without any determination or budgeting for maintenance. And when we came in, in democracy, post-1994, um, we found ourselves having to deal with additional infrastructure because our people wanted water, and immediately. And we've had to deal with capital budgets, not maintenance budgets. So the formation of driving cat cat capital budgets during that time without necessarily dealing with the maintenance budget has now created this, this effect of where we're struggling to deal with maintenance of infrastructure in the water and the ca capacity for us to have it. But there has to be new projects. For example, you have in the Free State the biggest, biggest dam in, in on, sat on, on the African continent, the Kharib Dam, and we cannot even pump that water into its own municipality. So infrastructure planning needs to change, and yes, we do need capital budgets, but there are infrastructure budgets at a national, provincial, and local level for this to happen. It's the management that we need to deal with, and this is where we are calling on you, my leaders, to deal with how we manage our people within these sectors to make sure that we deliver what it is that we need to deliver. On electricity, it's another job driver. So number one was water, secondly is electricity. In by 1994, comrades, only 36% of the South African population had their homes electrified, 36%. Today, in 2020, we've increased that to 84%. But we don't have stable and consistent electricity. We don't. And again, all I can say is management. Why are we utilizing the cost of coal, diesel, to keep electricity running when we've got solutions, renewable energy and the likes? So if we want to, as, as, as leaders, create a policy of an energy generation, a mix, is it called the energy mixed generation? We have coal, diesel, renewable energy and other types of mixed types of forms and inputs of, of energy. We can do that and create a cost efficient electricity supply. But we need to be able to also deal with the policy directors, the political will, and the management thereof. Now, what we've done from, from, from an to create an electricity uh, sustainable supply is uh, the president announced the generation of the 100 megawatts, uh, so the registration threshold has increased. Um, the amendments to the Electricity Regulation Act that had happened in 2021, the raised li licensing threshold for self-energy generation from one megawatt to 100 megawatts solely to expand the capacity of energy generation. All of those policy directives have been put in place and has been approved, but what is it that we're doing at a local level to make sure that it's happened? Where is the implementation? And it's up to us in our municipalities, in our provincial governments, to allow for the environment Issues of land and land use, the, the lease agreements, the ability for investors to come in and put such solutions in. And, and I want to talk to us about how we deal with investments because this is critical for labor. Uh, I'm going to talk about that now in the triple P process. How is it that we package it and create a model that is beneficial for everyone? And um, I think the Department of Minerals and Energy released a six bid recently under renewable energy for the independent power producer program, which opened at uh, the end of March in 2022. So I think there are options and possibilities for us to, to look at some of these solutions. Again, it is about coming together, unifying and understanding that we must all deal with a bigger purpose here, which is job creation and economic growth. And part of that 
is job drivers. I spoke about water, electricity. Third matter is land. We've done land audits as a government. So Public Works has completed land audits, um, which included land that's sitting with rural development, with agriculture and other public bodies. Municipalities are busy with their land audits. So the zoning, the ability to be able to understand which land parcels are beneficial for economic use, um, what the market-related prices would be, should it be for lease, should it be for sale, and so on and so forth. So, so in terms of that, um, there has been some work done, and the Premier in the State of the Province addressed outlined that the province has commenced with a program to distribute land to our people. I think so far there were, there were a few transactions that had concluded, but we had, currently we have 4,872 land parcels valued at 11 billion rands in the province. And um, the total number of pieces of land, 2,626 have been earmarked to be transferred to rightful beneficiaries. So those are traditional lands, those are lands that have already been allocated and so on, a title deed land and so on and so forth. So, so those are the ones that have already been earmarked. But in terms of the Land Management Act and in terms of procedural mechanisms in which the province needs to do it, that has been con concluded. The province together with national have concluded the legislation and the policies in that regard. So we are ready to be able to distribute land. Either we go out to market and we call for leases or we go out to market and we call for sale or if there is a public-private type of initiative, it also requires to go out to market. So, so those are some of the work that we are doing, and, and that's the, one of the job drivers to be able to produce some, some mechanisms to, be, to assist with um, the growth in this province. On public-private partnerships, Treasury is um, involved highly in the, the institutional requirements for triple Ps. And um, it, could all, it could be design, build, funding, operating uh, on infrastructure projects. Um, we look at the following to deepen this commitment between the public and the private partnerships. So we're saying that we want to do this to improve gross productivity growth, technological skills, spillover, and allow efficient execution of those projects. But what I would like to add, as I mentioned, these type of projects, when you have foreign investors or when you have investment. A model that I, I did in, when I was still in the private sector was that you have a foreign investor, could be whoever outside the country, you allow that investor to have a certain percentage share of that entity, but local requires a certain share and workers should have a preferential share um, trust. And I see it a lot happening in renewable energy projects. It happened in the bank that I worked for at the time where I had shares and I was a shareholder of that bank. And your workers, those who worked in that organization, had voting rights. Not just voice rights, but voting rights. So even if you have a preferential share trust for workers and it's 20% and the local individual has 31%, and the foreign person has the balance of 49%. South Africans still have the majority shareholding rights. And workers don't necessarily feel like slaves. They don't just feel like, I work here for a pension, I work here for a salary. I work here, but I'm also a shareholder. And that is the type of discussions that we should be going into when we deal with foreign direct investment. And I think it's something that we should talk, Honourable Speaker, about creating some sort of legislation around how we deal with foreign investment in the country. Because there are countries, comrades, where a foreigner is not allowed to buy land. Foreigner is not allowed to conduct business if you don't, not, you don't have a, a local person that is an owner. So it is up to us to make sure that these are some of the legislations that we should pass that should be progressive so that we could protect our democratic gains. On infrastructure, like I mentioned, we dealt with the infrastructure matters. Um, the issues of, yeah, 31% Mangaun, 20% Fizile Davi, Tabun Saniana 19, Neju Leputsa 16, 7% Karib. And we also looked at some of the possible um, catalytic projects in those districts so that we could also be able to support the districts with whatever economic drivers that they're dealing with. 
So if we just recap, it's water, electricity, land, triple P's, infrastructure. Those were some of the job drivers. Now we're coming to, to the upstream drivers, right? Which is technology and technology across the board. Across the board, agriculture is using drones. Agriculture is using uh, pesticide, uh, um, electronic devices to deal with pesticides. Infrastructure, you using this radi radi the radiology, is it radi radiology where you can look through the bricks and see how far you've gone down into construction sites. And in all sectors, we are looking at the, the use of technology, robotics, and artificial intelligence. And if we are not going to speed up a labor market, young people that are new entrants to the market is going to come in and take over the manner in which we conduct uh, the operations of organizations through these type of efficiencies. Industrialization is critical, and one of the key indices in which we calculate GDP is the value of product that is um, uh, produced within any market. And South Africa is lagging. China is 16.9% of the total global economy. The US, the, um, yeah, the US is still 21.6% of the global economy. Africa is just under 1%. We've got uh, Putadichaba Industrial Hub, Botsavela Industrial Hub, which is right close to our international airport, Bram Fischer, which we are trying to convert to a dry customs port. And those are all key drivers of making sure that product to market, efficient, fast, costs benefit without transporting too far. Uh, we, we central to South Africa, we right down the road from Kucha, right across the way to Dubai Trade Port, right up the way to uh, Johannesburg International Customs Port. And if we have a Bram Fischer Customs Dry Port, um, I can't see why we cannot be a favorable industrial hub for this country and a gateway into Africa. On investment promotion, I spoke about that. We do have investors in, in this province. We look at mine, the most recent investors is the 700 million investment on the gas pipeline um, with Renogen. And Coca-Cola is, is having some challenges. I know that we needed to have some conversations with them because of water, the water interruptions, uh, bloom water matters. Um, Clover disinvested recently because of the roads and some of the challenges at the rates in, uh, environment. So outside of promoting new investments is how do we secure our investment? Because our labor is affected then. And those are some of the conversations that we need to have in our social compact. And what are the key initiatives and incentives that we are doing to be able to deal with that? So as I, as I go along, I've got three three pages really left of what, what I really want to pass as, as, as a uh, foundation statement to our conversation today. But as we deal with those, those uh, job drivers, um, leadership, it is important for us to realize that as much as we, we're dealing with a conducive environment, we are struggling with the implementation, we are struggling with the management, we are struggling with the oversight. And that is something that we need to strengthen as a government, as this legislature. And I'm asking that we strengthen our people, our senior managers, our managers in all organizations and spheres, disciplinary processes, performance management, dealing with issues of um, just people not coming to work at, at a municipality. So as I consolidate, bargaining councils remain the central pillar of collective bargaining. And I, I think I'm speaking to the converted. I think everybody knows this. This is just the policy statement that I'm going to make. Participation on a bargaining council remains voluntary, but the Act provides a number of inducements for unions and employers to participate. In particular, the ability of a council to have its agreement extended to all employers and employees within the, its jurisdiction. The Act requires that the parties are representative in order to have an agreement extended, and the Minister retains the discretion to extend the agreement if the parties are only sufficiently representative, and failure to extend the agreement would threaten bargaining at, at various sector levels. The number of bargaining councils 
Thus has declined steeply in the recent years. We are aware of that. But the number of workers covered by bargaining councils has increased. On, on the speaker, collective bargaining and workers' voices, you do help and you can help address the challenges posed by a changing world of work, by the changing macroeconomic environment, by the changing work environment. As demographic and technological changes unfold, collective bargaining can be used to mediate adjustments in wages, mediate adjustments in working time, work organizations, task and response to new needs and flexible and in, a fl in a flexible and pragmatic manner. We know that mental health is a big matter at the moment. We know with the pandemic, the change of the work environment has stepped in, the manner in which we handle our households. Those are all matters that we hear, need to hear as, em, as employers and be able to adjust in order to deal with a more productive labor force. Collective bargaining can help to shape new rights, adapt existing rights, regulate, and the use of new technologies can provide active support to workers transitioning into new jobs and anticipated new skills. Speaker, two main mechanisms to dominate debates over the relationship between inequality and growth. The first is definitely employment and the remuneration behavior of the labor market. Strong positive employment and real wage responses to economic growth are major poverty alleviating forces. And emancipating from the performance of the public sector economy, these are just some of the foundational tools that we require to deal with the adjustment in, in managing the economy proactively. The second mechanism is the inflow of fiscal revenue and growth that makes it available for active social policy and poverty alleviation. Honorable Speaker, then active participation of employers, organizations, and trade unions in the agenda and setting processes is the best way to ensure that it measures adopted appropriate and collective bargaining functions effectively. Public authorities hardly um, will be successful in promoting collective bargaining if social partners do not use these institutions to support this process. Uh, so, honorable speaker, as I conclude, I would also like to state that as a province, we commit to help businesses rebuild. We commit to accelerate the implementation of economic reconstruction recovery plan to rebuild our economy, to create employment and drive inclusive growth. But it can only be done if we hold hands together, honorable speaker, in all forms and formations of the public private sector throughout the entire social compact and without labor as the, as the key driver to make sure that this happens, we are unable to do that succinctly. So with that said, Kia Leboa, I thank you very, very much. Thank you, Honorable MEC. Uh, we are going to take a 10 minutes body break. Uh, there's tea arranged also outside there. We've got two serving stations. Let's just be quick, 10 minutes, and then we must be back. Uh, let's see, 12. We can take that break.
Uh, good day, good day, good day. I'm sure that it helped, that the body break helped. You managed to have tea, because we know that it's cold here, and we want to apologize. We will just go straight to the presentations. Uh, Kosatu, representative, I'm sure you are ready. The floor is yours. Can come to the podium. to finish off. Okay. So do I call you honorable members? Oh, okay. All right. Uh, Please activate your mic. Oh, okay. Okay, thanks. Um... Let me take this opportunity uh, to greet you, honorable members. Uh, honorable Jerry and uh, Honorable Musia. Uh, honorable Jihad. Uh, honorable Hawelo. Wow. Uh, it's, it's such a strange feeling. Let me take this opportunity to acknowledge the, the speaker, the deputy speaker, the chief whip, and the program director, as well as the MEC for Treasury, May Khadija. Let me also acknowledge all the <coughs> comrades who are honorable members today. Uh, I greet you in the name of COSADU and uh, would like to appreciate the opportunity that we have to be sitting like this in this august house. And uh, I must indicate, uh, uh, Comrade Brian, that this is one of the gatherings that we may need to emulate outside this platform because Comrade Jihad, we, we're still saying workers of the world unite. The speaker said it. And uh, 
we need to talk about how workers unite going forward. We, we're meeting towards the end of the May month, which is a workers' month, and um, there's, <clears throat> there's been a number of challenges that, as workers, we've been facing. And this is supposed to be a month where we celebrate as workers. But certainly, of now late, there's very few things that we have that we can celebrate as workers. Because jobs have been on the deadline, and uh, our conditions of service have been on a deadline. Job creation uh, is on the deadline. And as workers, we have to take pills to sleep at night because we, we are under very immense mental pressure because of the financial situation that we, we live in. I mean, every worker of now late is supporting more than 10 people, and uh, that brings a lot of stress to us as workers. So... As workers, the, our ill health is also at stake here. And we have to take pills to sleep at night. Otherwise, sleep doesn't come. We, we've been facing challenges, and uh, COVID-19 brought in, even a, it worsened the situation, to, to say the least. Workers, it was like, it's workers who have brought COVID-19 to the shores of the country because every decision that was made, the workers were in the receiving end of that decision. Even as we speak now, workers are being dismissed just for not being convinced to go for voluntary vaccination. We still have workers continuously being dismissed. We still have the regulations that have been enacted by DEL, which still justifies that workers can be dismissed for not willing to be vaccinated. So there's very little that as workers can celebrate. Of course, there are gains that we had made previously, which the state as the employer is leading the attack on rolling back those gains. And uh, many employers have joined the band work on. I mean, SARS as a state-owned entity is just eager to please its boss, which is the state. They're now offering workers a 0% increase, which is very ridiculous. Yosibanya Stillwater have gone into the fray, offered, don't want to accede to the demands of workers. And the conditions of workers generally are being driven back. So that's another challenge that we're facing as workers. During this uh, COVID-19 pandemic regulations, which have been in place, there were some actions that were taken by the state, which we had initiated in many instances. And one of those was the 350 allowance that was given to, to uh, you know, workers who are currently not employed. And we, we, we feel, uh, Madam Speaker, as, as the Federation, that in as much as that was a correct move, but that cannot be a permanent solution. People who are in the welfare system of the province and of the country, there should be a way to graduate them out of that welfare system. The welfare system approach cannot be a permanent solution. In fact, every worker has pride in working for the money that he or she gets. There's very few, if they exist, people who will be happy to get money without working for it. They want to work so that they can make their own living. So consideration of implementing the decision of establishing a welfare, I mean a state-owned pharmaceutical company would be one of the great ideas that could be implemented at the provincial level so that we can then have an inclusive growth. 
But when we talk about growth, uh, program director, there's also other things that we need to be looking at. Uh, our government is allowing businesses to hoard trillions of rents. And yet we go out on international markets to go and fundraise, whilst our companies within our own borders are sitting on profits that have been generated through the blood, sweat, and tears of our people. There needs to be legislation that forces companies to reinvest the monies that they make back into the economy because they're sitting literally on trillions which are not coming back into the system and as a result, they're not giving the economy that catalyst that it needs to grow. State expenditure should prioritize local businesses. We, we, I, I recall fully well that the provincial uh, treasury budget explained when you presented the budget speech the, uh, the other day you emphasized on this matter. And as Kosatu in the first stage when we hosted our May Day in Harib district, we got face to face with naked poverty in that area. And in as much as we support the idea of a, a huge chunk, I mean, of increasing expenditure in Harib, but we need that there should be expenditure that is managed so that it changes people's lives. It shouldn't change individual lives. Because what has been happening previously is that there will be a lot of money that is invested, but during that investment that is made, then only individuals emerge with, you know, with a lot of money in their bank accounts, and that cannot be the correct things. Madam Speaker, the, 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 the budget cuts have affected us very negatively as workers. And one key factor, Comrade Elijah, is, is, a, is, a, is a, the budget cuts into the CCMA. And the budget cuts to the CCMA has led to reduction of part-time commissioners being able to do their work whilst the CCMA is not appointing more commissioners on a permanent basis. And that has resulted in a situation whereby we have huge backlogs at, that, at the CCMA level. So that means that even though the CCMA is such a brilliant idea and a good tool that protects workers and the members of the working class, but the problem is that it has been rendered incapacitated. We, we, we need a wage policy in our country and in our province. That wage policy should then be able to determine the, the floor and the ceiling of wages. It, 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 I mean, in any language, it cannot be justified that workers in Sibanye, they can be given 150 rents. I mean, 150. A, a blue one and a red one. Is it red or pink, brother? They, they refuse that amount. But at the same time, the person who refuses to give workers that amount of money, he collects 300 million rand in one year. Just one individual. Because he is the CEO. That cannot be correct. And when you follow that up, you then told that the trend in mining is that CEOs will earn between 9 and 480 million per annum. And, this, and they say that is a normal uh, wage, I mean, uh, package for them. It cannot be correct. We cannot have laws that perpetuate inequality. We need to have laws that also put a stop in this inequality that's, that's raging. Program director, we, 
In our industrial sectors, we need assistance as our province was constituted with former homelands. And former homelands used to have sweetness for industries to come and invest, invest in those homelands. For an example, somebody investing in Tabancho. There was no general sales tax in Tabancho during the time. And that was a sweetener for industries that were investing there. Those investing in Kwagwa, there were huge cuts. You know, there were huge, uh, you know, um, the prices of tax and raises were placed at a level that were affordable for them. There were also other tax holidays that were given to them. And those are the things that managed to keep those industries at that particular level. But now, the playing field has been leveled, but it has been leveled not addressing the historical problems and the historical in, in imbalances. As a result, the factories in those areas are endangered species. They're closing and living. And workers and communities in those areas are left at a very poor, at a very poor state. So it's important that those incentives should then be relooked into by our provincial government. Our retail sector needs protection. Township economy is in danger. And by the way, township economy has been handed on a silver platter to foreign nationals because municipalities are not implementing the bylaws. And some of, many of these shops are not complying with environmental health legislation. But there's no compliance that's been put in place. And that is a problem. And at another level, Madam Speaker, we're not sure what's been delivered into those shops. And increasingly, our people are being injured by unregistered firearms from these particular shops. And what else that is illegal that goes into these shops when nobody is monitoring those shops? So it's also a point of concern at another level, at the security level. So implementation of bylaws is very important. In local government, uh, all we ask him for, can we allow workers to do their work? Give them the tools of trade, stop interfering, and allow them to do their work. That's all we're asking for, so that workers can be able to deliver services. In many instances, like here in Mangaum, trucks are not able to go out to perform their work because there's no diesel in many instances. There's one municipality where I was two weeks back where four teams working in water reticulation, they have to share one vehicle. It's four teams. A vehicle is, is that vehicle for a week. This week, this team is using the vehicle. The other three t teams, they have to stay going to Copland in the whole day for three weeks. They wait for their turn for the vehicle to come to them. And that cannot be a correct thing. Our municipalities need to be supported. All we ask him for, please allow us to do our work. Please pay us on time. Pay our third parties so that we don't have a, a, a crisis. The state need to intervene in Sibanya still water. It cannot be correct that one mine collapsed the economy of the whole region. Because the impact that Sibanya has in terms of the number of workers that Sibanya employs in that area, the impact is just too huge. 
and the state, there's a need for intervention at that level. We need the feeling of post in the provincial government. We really, really need the feeling of post. And we need compliance with the norms and standards. For an example, in nursing you'll know you need one nurse for so, so many particular patients. You'll need one police person for so particular citizens. You'll need one teacher for so particular number of learners. And we cannot be that almost 30 years into, um, into our freedom, township schools are still overcrowded when former Model C schools, if you have 30 learners in a class, that's too much. The average amount of figure is around 25. There needs to be, uh, we find a balance there and address that problem. I want to conclude. I think, Madam Speaker, regulations are being amended. And some of those amendments that have been made are affecting us negatively. One key decision that was taken during those consultations is this thing of working from home. Working from home is a very dangerous uh, you know, approach to us as workers because it creates a problem whereby my own little house is then converted into the employer's property. And my children, it's a problem when my children start playing and I'm on a Zoom meeting. And I'm in their home. And that cannot be a correct thing that such a huge decision is made without consultation of labor. But the other big challenge is that there's a need for economic growth. Where is labor playing a role in terms of the discussions around economic growth in the province? There's no platform. So it is important that that, problem, that platform needs to be created. Let me take this opportunity to thank the, the speaker, the, the staff of the legislature, all the... Um, um, COSATU team that is here, uh, SAFTU team that is here. Yes, uh, there still needs to be a discussion about unity between COSATU and SAFTU, and I hope I'm on record. Yes, there needs to be that discussion. Uh, we need to build that unity. We cannot be only the legislature. We need to find our own ways of coming together. Uh, we, we would like to take this opportunity to thank SAFTU as well and uh, thank everyone who has participated and uh, welcome the opportunity, uh, Madam Speaker, that we would, uh, this is the beginning of a process which will lead towards us having annual workers' parliament. And I must indicate that when we in national meetings of uh, COSATU, other provinces will be telling us that they have in their annual uh, workers' parliament. And uh, I mean, we'll just be uh, looking from side to side. Uh, something like that. We'll be doing like that and not having anything to report. But thank you very much, program director. I wish uh, this August House uh, fruitful deliberations. Thanks. Delegate Ndadema Khadzi, when uh, he started his speech, he was uh, referring to you as honorable members. Now I knew that he was not going to sustain that because <laughs> the second time when he was addressed, he said, comrades. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you very much. Um, the first positive sign of this workers' parliament, I think, is the confirmation from a delegate Mahlazi from what the speaker said in her opening remark, in her keynote address. The speaker said this workers' parliament is the catalyst uh, for future engagement. 
and I think and the Demashazi just confirmed that. Uh, we are going now to the inputs by COSADU affiliates. Uh, we don't have a list. Uh, speaker said uh, she prefers this session to be uh, we must engage. So now this is time now for us to engage. We've got 30 minutes for this session. So we are now going to allow the affiliates now of COSADU to give in two, three, four, five, six. All of you, each is going to have five minutes. So you can come in that order. You, when you arrive here, you just mention your name and the union you are from. And then you can go. I have recognized you, then you can come. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Program Director. My name is Howard Mkavisa. I'm the Provincial Secretary of, of Nehau in the province here. <coughs> well, some of us are not used to these things. <laughs> so that is why I would uh, acknowledge every time when we are guided as to how the process is uh, uh, pro, uh, uh, pro, uh, proceeds, in fact. Uh, Chairperson, let me take this opportunity to acknowledge the presence of the uh, speaker, the deputy speaker, and the chief whip, and the MEC present in this meeting, and the worker leaders in this in this house uh, from different uh, federation or affiliates. In fact, if I might put that in in that way, we we really appreciate the the fact that we have been invited in this kind of a platform, which is very rare that we have this kind of platform as, as unions or as a federation. We, we must indeed indicate that uh, we are honored to be invited to this important gathering to come and contribute to this discussion or the topic of today, which is, the, which is of high interest to us as the working class in this province. Precisely because one, one way or the other, we are affected by the identified topic of today. The first point that we wish to make is to, to this meeting is, is it relates to the outcomes and the impact of our discussion. Most importantly, the feedback on conclusions and way forwards of our discussion. And lastly, we are going to arrive to a point wherein we have resolution of our discussion and whether these conclusions are going to be implemented or not. We are raising this question precisely because, in our view as, a, as the worker leaders, the time of only talking to us is a history as working class. We need to act and act with precision. It is therefore from that account in which we would urge this House that we need to ensure that we turn the talk into the work, much as the Speaker has indicated or alluded to the fact that whatever the resolutions or discussions that we arrive at or conclusions that we arrive at will be implemented. We are further indicating to this meeting that we are going to put a close eye on that, in ensuring that we monitor the progress as committed by the, by the, the, by the speaker here in this, honorable speaker in this house, that there will be implementation of resolutions that we take in these discussions. Prime Director, we were tempted as now to, to say much on these topics precisely because we are directly affected by, 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 by what has been identified as an engagement of today. But because of the, the time slots that were given, we are going to shrink our, our participation, our contribution, so that at least we are within the time uh, slots that were, were provided uh, in this meeting. Uh, Program Director, the state of collective bargaining, transformation and broader challenges faced by the workers in the, pro in the workplace the topic on its own stands, it has fundamental issues that is collective bargaining and transformation. We would, would first wish to start with collective bargaining and in doing so, first define collective bargaining in class context. The state of bargaining, of a collective bargaining is a process of negotiating, negotiating which involves a form of discussion, be it formal or informal, with a view to reach an agreement and therefore for a collective bargaining to be effective, it is important that these negotiations be conducted in a good faith. 
Collective bargaining involves a process of joint decision making that helps to build trust and mutual respect between the parties and enhance the quality of labor relations, which is now deemed to be collapsing and it is under a serious attack now of late. Fundamentally, the purpose of collective bargaining in capitalist mode of production, like in South Africa, it is to ensure that there is a labor peace. For these reasons, we have seen in South Africa the establishment of collective bargaining institutions, including at a social level, NECLEC, the Labor Relations Act that promotes centralized bargaining, the Labor Relations Act that promotes collective bargaining at plant level. This tells us that the forces in the collective bargaining will may from time to time change tactics and strategies to win the battle. And this battle is stemming from the conflict interest. It is our view that collective bargaining in South Africa it is at the crossroad and on the upper hand is the state leading way in support of the employers in this uh, destruction of collective bargaining. Court, court Chair, it is further the naked attack on collective bargaining government based on the false argument that public service wage bill is too high relatively to budget as it refers to the total of public sector wage bill. We want to be specific, Chair, to, to raise one of the uh, nerve-wracking situations that we are confronted with as the working class that the rights of workers to strike has been limited by the legislation in the form of essential service. Most of the employers today runs to the Essential Service Commission to declare the institution as essential service. This means that those workers involved in the essential service, the right to strike has been taken away. It is therefore from that account in which we are saying as the, as the Federation that we are very much concerned about these amendments of the Constitution or the Labor Relations Act, which seeks to undermine or further, uh, further undermine the rights of the working class. It has been it, it may be argued that uh, the purpose of Labor Relations Act is to, is to prohibit, if not discourage, proliferation of unions in the workplace. The question rises then as to how then does the Department of Labor continue to recognize unions to operate in sectors where already we have unions. This means that in the country there is a proliferation of trade unions. The recent Constitutional Court judgment on Resolution 1 of 2018 in the public service dealt another blow to a collective bargaining, which is a perpetual attack on collective bargaining, wherein the public servants could not uh, uh, receive the uh, increment as per the agreement that has been signed by both the employer and the labor, wherein the, the employer has reneged in implementing that resolution. We are very much concerned about the state of collective bargaining in the, in the, in the province at, at large. Mr. President, part of the issues that we want to raise is that uh, recently we have witnessed that South African Revenue Service immediately followed this route by reneging from the agreement that is, pro that is a product of collective bargaining. SARS refused to implement the last leg of the agreement, citing, citing precisely the reasons used by the state as per the employer, as the employer in the Constitutional Court. Testimony to this, uh, uh, Honorable Chair, it is precisely what is transpiring now in, in the mining, mining fraternity wherein our employees are now in three months at home without receiving the increment, increment. So it is very evident that the collective bargaining is undermined all the way in this country. We want to, to put an emphasis on the issues that we would wish that in our province here they can find expression and be implemented or addressed as swiftly as possible, uh, Madam Speaker. One, we want to raise the issue of the lack of staff in various government departments or shortage of staff in various government departments, wherein we have seen this becomes a burden to other employees because they are now compelled to perform duties of another person who is not within the structure or who is in a, within the structure but is not employed. And here we've got vacant fund and post in various government departments, and those posts are not filled. There is lack of appetite from the side of the government to fill those critical posts within uh, 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 government departments. 
But one other critical issue that we want to raise, uh, it is around the issue of this acting positions that takes forever to intervene as swiftly as possible uh, around such issues. One other critical issue that we want to, uh, uh, to cite in this meeting is that in, in Department of Social Development, we've got uh, employees called uh, ex pioneers Masupatzela. Yes, we appreciate the fact that uh, during the, the State of province, uh, province Address, the Premier has touched on that issue to say that their levels will be upgraded to level three, salary level three. And yes, indeed, it has happened. But what we want to raise in this meeting is that those people are not properly placed in their positions. What we are saying by not properly placed is that they are in level three as appointed as messengers in various offices in the province here. And yet, their responsibilities contradict their rank because they are performing the responsibilities of administrat uh, administrative clerks and, and all that. But they are appointed as messengers in those offices. We are therefore saying that that is high level of, ex of exploitation to our people because what they are performing, it is what they have been appointed for. So that matter should find expression or those people should be uh, properly placed in those, in those departments. We want to further raise an issue around our security officials. In various departments, those security uh, personnel, it is, a, it is a hassle for them to can get their overtime allowance in most government departments. Some of them, they've got uh, outstanding payments of their overtime set one from about six months close to a year this is part of those uh, overtime uh, allowances. We are pleading to yourself to say that those issues should find expression and swiftly attended to. But lastly, uh, Madam Speaker, what we want to raise as a matter of concern is the upward mobility within the workplaces in different uh, government departments. There is no upward mobility. There are people who just parachute to senior positions without proper HR recruitment processes. So we, we really condemn such. We are saying our people from, the within, from within the system, they must get the latitude to can be promoted. Those who qualify for those positions, let them give, be given the latitude to, to be promoted or apply for those positions so that they are able to can uh, to can uh, be in a better positions uh, in their different workplaces. Madam Speaker, lastly, before we said we want to raise this critical issue around the, the state of our workers or the impact of COVID-19 in our workplaces. We want to appreciate that uh, COVID-19 came at the time we were very flat-footed, we did not expect that and all that. And uh, it deprived us the latitude to, to can interact time has slay with our members precisely because of the strict conditions of COVID-19. And uh, we want to say most of the employers took advantage of about the situation that we are not able to interact directly with our members because there were very strict conditions uh, around uh, maybe having this kind of uh, formal meetings with our members and all that. And some employers took advantage of that. But I want to say most of the employers even now, much as the COVID-19 restrictions has been eased uh, through things as, as, as the employer. So we are calling upon all the employers in government here to ensure that we, we, we adhere to COVID-19 regulations and provide our, our, our employees with relevant uh, uh, protection clothing uh, that speaks to the uh, COVID-19 regulations. Uh, Madam Speaker, we, without uh, wasting your time, because we know that uh, our our time is limited here in so far as we are, we are, we are given we are to participate in this in this in this august house but we we want to say in conclusion we have witnessed some employers conducting uh, this uh, occupational health and safety what you call committees in fact establishing those committees uh, in various workplaces but in most of the workplaces, the, the, the labor is not involved or does not take, but, uh, con they, do, they don't participate or they are not invited in those meetings to can form these uh, occupational health and safety uh, committees within different workplaces. Uh, we would like to posit that. Aluta.
I gave a provincial secretary on how five minutes. He used the five minutes I gave him. He gave himself another five minutes. <laughs> and now, because he's operating within our sector, in our institution, now he took another five minutes for them. So I'm not sure what ammunition do you have <laughs> over us. <Aras. laughs> so we thank, thank you very much for that. So we will see what other, what other affiliates of COSADU are going to do because he took leverage that he's, he's operating in this institution. So it's fine, then you can have another affiliate. <laughs> I'm sure that was a friendly input. Yeah? No, there was nothing violent about that. Honorable let me see. Did you hear them? <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, thanks. Uh, I'm not sure whether I'm on. Or oh, I must press which one? This one. Okay. Oh, now I'm on. Oh, no. No, thanks. Chair, uh, uh, I was just saying. Um, uh, all animals are equal <laughs> and must be treated equal. <laughs> um, well, let me start by saying, uh, Honorable Speaker, before you dismiss me from your house, let me recognize you, um, my fellow comrade. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, my apology, Chair. Um, but you cannot erase history. Um, my name is Tisezoma Shatsi. I am the Provincial Secretary of South African Municipal Workers Union, SAMU. Um, I, I will be just alluding to what the Provincial Secretary uh, of course, I do. my Honorable uh, Masati was presenting, I will just zoom into uh, specifics. And it's important that uh, they be recorded in, in this sitting because, you know, local government is one sector uh, which is highly politicized. Uh, and in, it, it's a sector that was created to ensure that our communities receive services promptly, uh, but we are experiencing uh, otherwise. Um, as, as the topic said, and, and uh, Honorable Masatu was saying, local government uh, bargaining, bargaining processes and platform are totally disregarded. Uh, maybe one will say it's a form of its establishment or not, because the composition of management includes councillors and management. When, 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 when that bargaining process must kick start, at some point councillors won't be there, and it it turns every process null and void if councillors are not there. When councillors are there, management are not there. They will send people who are not decision makers. And when you took resolution in that bargaining platform, they won't be implemented. Because those who take decision will be now questioning uh, the decisions of that. Um, <clears throat> It's an area or a sector which is highly politicized where we experience nature of factional politics on daily lives. Uh, where if at the location you don't agree with your leader who's also a councillor or an MM in your branch, uh, you'll suffer the consequences in the workplace. Uh, go and ask what's happened in Metsimaholo, where we lost many employees who were dismissed because of political battles. Go in Mukaka, where uh, 33 employees are still outside. 
uh, being dismissed for political reasons and exposing corruption in local government. We, we are faced with health and safety environment in municipalities, PPs, working environment. It's, it's bad. And COVID MEC exposed municipalities. And to date, municipal, municipal workers who even were tested positive, not even a single one was even paid a, 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 an allowance as required. When you go to fund study, there was an appalling situation that I must record. There's a plant outside there, and it's meant by women. There's no water for drinking. There are no toilets. There are bushes there. So these women, when they are to respond to nature, they must go to the bush. So that's the situation of health and safety that we find ourselves in. There's a workshop in Butsabelo. It's up there on the side of the mountain. If Speaker, we can visit that area, you'll see that it's a pig stall. No employees are supposed to work there. But it's still operational. It has been reported to the health, I uh, mean, uh, to inspectors in the uh, Department of Labor, but it's still operational. That's the situation of health and safety. Municipal workers are using fleet that are not roadworthy, which uh, expired discs, uh, uh, but they are always receiving those insults. Non-payment of third parties, it's very problematic. Mafube leading the pack. We currently have an old man there who was supposed to have gone to pension at 65 years. Because municipalities are unable to pay pension, they extended his contract up to 68 years. He's now crippled in wheelchair with no feet, both because of illness, but he's still without pension. We have a, a student, we even asked the Premier to intervene in Copan because those kids, one is at metric, one is at tertiary, and she was struggling even to register at tertiary, and unfortunately the father passed on, and the pension is still outstanding. So it's a struggle for this poor daughter to access a tertiary education. So non-payment of third, is, third parties, it's very problem in, in, in municipalities. It's Omafuwe, Kopano, Mohokar, and Masilo Yana, who are leading the pack. What is also confronting local government is late payment of salaries and non-payment of salaries. You'll receive a memo on the day of payment of salaries that your salary will be delayed. And debit orders must go through. Debit orders won't give you a notice that we will delay your debit order. And your, you must feed your family with the little salary that you receive. But management will sit and wait for the last day and they will issue a memo that your salaries won't be paid. And you, you will observe honorable members in Copano. Last year from September, employees until January, they were not paid their salaries. Now when there is intervention, when things are supposed to be normal, this month they are not paid because the municipal manager is on suspension. 
the CFO council took his powers because of wrong things there. The mayor has, on the eve of processing salaries, gave an acting municipal manager, who is the director, a termination letter with immediate effect. So the municipality is left with no one to authorize payment of salaries. So workers are unpaid even today. And there's no communication, nothing. The mayor is not responding to calls. He's not even talking to a, 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 a organized labor. But he was brave to go on media and explain what is happening. But workers, he can't go and address them. That's the situation, and communities think that work, municipal workers are refusing to work. They don't know the frustration that we are working in. There's lack of agency in filling of vacancies at management level. The high rate of uh, uh, vacancies in municipalities is very high. And, and it will take some time before the vacancies are filled. And, and unfortunately, the provincial cocktail is not playing its role in this regard. And there seems to be also a biasness in uh, issuing concurrences. In a certain municipality, a concurrence will be issued. In another municipality, where a person with similar conditions with that municipality, a concurrence with we will be withheld and saying your qualifications are not relevant. So, uh, COCTA is playing a role that we, we view as questionable in, in, in municipalities. There's non-implementation of Section 106 reports by COCTA. They send people to go and investigate. When reports reflect a true refraction and, uh, I, and that report affects a uh, political favorites, it won't be implemented, it won't be presented in council. Go and ask what happened to the Section 106 report in Machali. And the culprits are still there. Honorable Speaker, in local government, if you haven't read Animal Farm book, go to local government, you will observe an animal farm approach. Some animals are treated better than others. Senior managers are untouchable in local government. And that's where collapse of services are. That's where corruption is. But they are not touched. Even when the reports are out, they will be protected. We even wrote letters to the mayors exposing these reports that they must be taken care of, but they won't. The only one a senior manager will be disciplined is when he's, he or she is not favor with the political leaders who are in power. But as long as you are in good books, you can do wrong things, you can buy municipal car fund today, tomorrow it will be vanished. You won't be touched. I am sure that the uh, MEC Finance is aware that the municipal manager of Malut was even boldly issued a memo taking away the functions of the service chief executive officer, which are legislated by the, by the MFMA. And the mayor is quiet. The problem of the mayors that are pocketed by the municipal managers because they want to be paid twice by the council and by the municipal manager. So I'm not sure this payment from municipal manager, how is it delivered at night or when we, we are in church. So they are unable to touch their municipal managers. So, but these poor workers, they are being charged every day. But these thieves, 
they remain safe and they are collapsing local government. And if you want to know and observe where is local government getting it wrong, concentrate and zoom into senior managers. You'll get the answer. And as soon as you don't address that, local government will remain a problem and poor communities will remain receiving these poor and lip services. I thank you. Provincial Secretary, uh, you said all animals are equal, and I've seen that you also used the 15 minutes that the Provincial Secretary of Nehau used. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, the floor is yours, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you, Program Director. Uh, yeah. uh, let me start by introducing myself. Uh, I am Brian Motsabi, a Provincial Secretary of uh, Democratic Nursing Association of South Africa. Uh, Denosa. Um, program director, let me also take this opportunity to pass my gratitude to, to Madam Speaker, Honorable Sifuba, uh, the Deputy Speaker, uh, members of this House, uh, Federation leaders, all trade union leaders present here. Uh, delegates, ladies and gentlemen, I greet you all. Program Director, uh, I come from a sector operating in the healthcare. And as a trade union in, in, in health sector, uh, we believe the healthcare is very important uh, to economic transformation because uh, we, we are here today, uh, Honorable MEC, talking about how to boost the economy. And you need healthy workers and, and South African citizens uh, to be productive, to boost this economy. Uh, that's why we are important. Um, we are honored uh, to take part in the Workers' Parliament this year under the theme, uh, the impact of COVID-19 pandemic in the economy and collective bargaining. Um, without wasting time, let me go straight to our inputs as DINOSA, the uh, program director. Uh, the decision by the South African government to shut down a large chunk of the economy in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we are aware it resulted in the economic crisis. The economy has declined since this stringent lockdown as a measure to cap the spread of the virus. And we are saying that the damage is uncertain. Uh, it will take years uh, to understand where the damage occurred and how severe it was. We have noted the government announced a number of measures uh, to caution the impact. Uh, this included increasing social grants, uh, special grants to the unemployed, uh, introduction of the employer relief scheme, um, whereby employers were, um, were applying for funds to pay their employees. However, we are saying that scheme excluded about three to five million uh, workers in the informal economy, uh, which is an important labor market as well. However, we know that uh, the informal economy uh, consists of about 34% of workers uh, in the country. We noted this scheme was to build 
uh, was built to assist employers in financial distress to continue to operate and avoid retrenchments. This scheme permitted employers who have not registered their workers with UIF. Uh, a report by the Department of Labor uh, suggested that uh, employers who didn't benefit from this scheme were about 28% of them in the country. 1.8 million employers were registered with the fund. Uh, 55,000 applications were received and only 37,000 claims were processed. From State's essay uh, released this report that formal sectors companies, about 46% of them were closed during COVID. This hard lockdown had devastating consequences on many households. Many lost their main source of income and there was a, they were exposed to food security and a hunger. Uh, conditions. We're saying this because, you know, the more you have uh, people exposed to hunger, the more they are vulnerable to opportunistic diseases like COVID-19. Another problem we identified is that employers did not show any social solidarity to workers. Workers were forced to use paid leave uh, during that period, which left them vulnerable financially for the future. Delegates, the country's economy wasn't in great shape before COVID-19, we must admit that. Uh, there was a recorded average growth of about 2% between 2008 and 2012. In the last decade, uh, Unemployment rate has increased to about 20%. And we have reached an all-time uh, record of about 30% of unemployment rate in the country during 2020. Now, DINOS are operating in the health sector. We are saying that the safety of individuals and sustainability of jobs is important to us. We know that uh, many sectors were affected, but mostly those who were affected included included sectors in the mining and mineral, the construction, transport, retail, and tourism. In the end, all sectors were affected because there was a reduced economic activity that led to reduced labor and capital demand. Let me just mention the major impacts of COVID-19 uh, experienced. There was a decline in the GDP growth, about minus one ten percent. There's a high unemployment rate and poverty, and females, uh, sp specifically poorest uh, female-headed households, were negatively affected. We are raising this issue because uh, females are very important in the population. Uh, and if you could note MEC, uh, Honorable MEC, there's a high cases of maternity. I don't want to indulge on that, but uh, this is one of the major problems in the, in the health system. Uh, maternity, mortality, and rates are high. Now, as the country is still regaining control, as one of the important interventions. We call for protecting vulnerable populations like the women and the children. Uh, findings indicate that unemployment and po poverty is not uniform across skilled workers and gender. Most skilled, most least skilled workers and poor females are the ones who suffered the most during COVID-19. And key actions or proposals we are, we are stating here today is that we can the employer promote investment in those affected sectors and recover some of the lost jobs. Another impact we have noted is that uh, our healthcare system is not ready to respond to the next health threat. 
COVID-19 demonstrated how weak our health system is. It provided fertile ground for growth and spread of dangerous pathogens like COVID-19. We call for investment in healthcare to boost the research, development, innovation, and manufacturing of health tools. In our view, this could also underspin a strong pharmaceutical industry, which is fundamental to creating resilient health systems. The situation we found ourselves in, particularly here in the Free State, uh, what we saw during COVID-19, just to motivate how weak our health system was, found ourselves opening COVID wards in basements of hospitals. Uh, buildings out, uh, outside the, the health facilities were utilized to, to form COVID wards. Uh, tenderization of tools of trade, uh, and we saw how monies were, were misused in terms of giving PPE contracts and all of those things. Now, COVID opened our eyes to see how far we lag behind in terms of testing, vaccination, vaccination and therapeutics. Our testing rate was 40% times lower than the European countries. Less population of the country is vac vaccinated. Now we're saying investment in healthcare will increase pharmaceutical companies uh, who will have full manufacturing capabilities. I must say that, uh, Madam Speaker, again, we are also calling for a state-owned pharmaceutical company. Uh, what we saw during COVID is that vaccination was procured outside the continent. And, you know, in such situation, wherever you are experiencing a pandemic, uh, the healthcare system needs to, to respond very fast. Now, by having our own pharmaceutical companies, we will also assist to ensure that our people will receive treatment on time. Also, furthermore, to state that uh, we've got a university of medicine, uh, or a faculty of medicine here in the University of the Free State, but we don't have uh, the pharmacy school within the faculty. This shows how far we are as the province. This disease disseminates the population, they hinder economy and social development of the country. Let me go straight to the impact of these viruses, particularly on workers or nurses. Nurses experienced high level of stress while they made considerable uh, personal sacrifices for patients during COVID-19. Some of them chose not to live at their home to save their families from being infected. Some of them worked for long hours uh, while there were colleagues who were ill uh, and while the COVID numbers were rising. These workers worked under demanding conditions. The healthcare system had numerous challenges during the pandemic and constraints. And these challenges included overcrowding high bed occupancy rate, uh, limited financial resources, budget constraints, critical shortage of staff, old infrastructure, suppliers shortages, like your pharmaceuticals, your linen, and your PPEs, and outdated medical equipment. This virus presented healthcare workers with trauma, uncertainty, and anxiety. Furthermore, uh, Madam Speaker, because of the economic situation we find ourselves in, we're still experiencing a lot of healthcare workers migrating to European countries uh, because there are no opportunities in the country. Nurses were called during the pandemic. Uh, temporary contracts were offered. They were called to come and assist. Now we are over the pandemic. Those contracts 
have expired. Those temporary contracts and nurses, most of them are, are unemployed and sitting at home. So we call for the employer to, to please rectify that. Uh, those nurses who were given one year, two year contracts during COVID. It is crucial that government leaders show empathy to workers, particularly frontline front workers, and respond positively to their request. This year we are calling for a 10% increase, increment during salary negotiations, 2.5, 2,500 housing allowance, buzzer scheme for public workers, servants, implementation of outstanding resolutions. It's important to make inputs uh, on the state of bargaining currently now, because bargaining Collective bargaining is one of the gains made by workers in promoting labor peace, and it's a platform to address uh, workers' issues. But lately, what we have seen from the employer is that this, that forum is not taken serious, and processes were undermined. An example of such is an implementation of the last leg of the Resolution 1 of 2018, and workers has, are not happy at all and they are starting to lose trust in the governing party. Uh, my comrade from Nehawu mentioned the issue of health and safety in the workplace. So I will not touch into that just to save time. Thus, what is most worrying is that no token of appreciation has been shown to workers who were frontline workers during COVID-19. There's no progress on the uh, uniform resolution implementation plan and what nurses in particular are saying, Madam Speaker, is that come 2023 20, October they are waiting to receive their uniform uh, because we want to be identified wherever we are in South Africa. If you go to Cape Town and you see a police officer, you will see the same police officer here in the Free State but with nurses. It is not like that. That's why we are saying we are calling for fast tracking of that implementation and come 21 October 2023, we will be waiting for the uniform nurses. In conclusion, uh, Madam Speaker, I would like to say uh, to you as our employer and leaders, uh, please be responsive in acknowledging matters raised by workers. Uh, any economic policy responses that the government will engage in should take informal economy into account and provide support to such economy. Uh, so the sectors that were hit hard, uh, they must be supported. And, and the policies should also raise, uh, policies raised to also address the, the incomes of the poor as well. So as I conclude, uh, I want to say to you, uh, MEC, Honorable Brown, uh, you must continue to ensure that there's generous spending or allocation of budget uh, to health, as always. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The fourth one. So the five minutes rule, I think you have seen that it doesn't work. It doesn't work at all. But, but you know what, what makes the five what makes the five minutes rule not to be applicable is because it's the provincial secretaries who are presenting. So they used to present organizational report. So they normally like to go into details. <laughs> so we allow that process to unfold. Uh, you can proceed. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Program Director. All protocol observed. Um, my name is Kidiboni Frank. I'm the Deputy Secretary of SATU. Um, Madam Speaker, thank you very much for the invite.
like I indicated to say all protocol observed because I don't want to leave anyone behind. The importance of collective bargaining as a forum that was brought about by our democratic government led by the African National Congress is to promote employer-employee relations at workplace. And this was a milestone achieved to guarantee security for many workers. It is unfortunate and saddening to observe the regression on this milestone under the same government that has been championing its introduction. With the current development, um, the writings on the wall that as a country and the province, we are on a downward spiral collective bargaining. Let us be relevant uh, and, and focus in our situation as teachers, uh, education workers in the province on collective bargaining. In the public sector and particularly where we are as a union, we can indicate that our chamber has consistently achieved its quarterly uh, uh, targets, despite some challenges that we are having. We still have issues of ECD practitioners who are still working as contractors. Your foundation phase, you still take it as if it's, it's, it's just a mefela um, at Despite the fact that South African population consists of more females than males, as government we have been regressing in terms of gender equity in the workplace. Feeling of vacant strategic position by females, it's still a challenge, MEC. I mean, you can even see now that I'm the only female among this men who are presenting. What does that say to you? And as a deputy, not even a provincial secretary. <laughs> um, labor section in our department, it's a Hollywood. It's all actors. Um, and HR, labor section, HR section, curriculum section, they are key areas in the bargaining. And if they are not taken seriously, the bargaining is under threat. As such, we have been vocal on the filling of vacant posts in the public service where the matter was even elevated to the premier's office. It is unhealthy to have everyone in key positions in the HR and labor section in acting capacity. You have your acting DDG, HR, acting chief director, HR, acting director, HR, acting director, labor. I mean, we are in Hollywood. The abnormal situation is adversely affecting the day-to-day -day running because people, when they are acting, they don't want to step on anybody's toes, especially the employer, because they want to be given those positions. Um, and thus gave impact on collective bargaining as employer is struggling to make a meaningful contribution. We call upon the government, especially your department, uh, Honorable Gajija, uh, Treasury, to approve the advertisement of this post as a matter of agency. One other critical matter is that of ensuring that people with relevant skills and capacity are appointed in the filling of posts to be able to provide required support to the workers. Workers in the education sector continue to experience uh, the following challenges despite numerous meetings with the Department of Education. Temporary educators are not paid on time. I mean, how do you employ somebody and when it's month end, you don't remember them? We have, unions have to remind you that you employed this person, then pay him or her. Inequality in resources. Uh, the pandemic exposed us. That's when we started to, to see that we are not equal. The resources, your schools in, in town and your schools in townships, we don't have laboratories, we don't have sporting facilities, we don't have libraries. And it remains high between uh, your former Model C's and our township schools. And this situation is very strenuous on workers because they have to improvise. 
a teacher in a, a former model school, C school and a teacher in township, they prepare differently. This one in township must buy his or her own charts to go and prepare lessons for, for, for kids. You must buy tools to make your classroom beautiful. You must even buy polish for your class to be clean. But in, in Model C schools, you don't see that. They don't, teachers don't even sweep or clean their classes there. We have uh, overcrowded classrooms, especially in lower grades. And speaking from, from, from experience, a foundation-faced teacher, it's difficult teaching 60 learners in a classroom. You can't interact with all of them. It means we will always have in learners who still struggle to read and do your, your, your basic mathematics. Because when do we get time to reach that 30th learner in 30 minutes period. Um, our MEC promised us uh, in our uh, conference, Congress to say, no, we'll make sure that we decrease the number of, of learners in, in, in foundation phase. We are going to hold him uh, to that. We've got huge spending on metric camps when investment has to be done in lower grades. Free State is, is a metric a, a, a province. We don't consider other classes. What we want is number one. But how do you get number one when you did not start with the foundation? I mean, how do you build a house? You start with the roof and then you, you go to the foundation. We must invest in great ones and, and your foundation phase so that when they come to metric, we don't spend that much. Our teachers are, are spending their uh, nights in camps. You leave your family and your children, and you go and stay in a camp of metric uh, and with, with uh, your learners. What happens in your own home? Your children are now smoking nyaope because you are not there to monitor them. Um, even marriages are broken. I mean, how do I go and sleep there and leave my husband at, alone at, how, at home? Who am I expecting uh, to take care of my husband? I'm not going to have teachers. We are regressing on the gains we had as workers. Conditions of service for education in townships, schools have changed drastically. Our teachers are now working Monday to Sunday. Monday to Sunday. You spoke about uh, uh, waking hours, Madam Speaker, when we were here, eight hours. We no longer have that. They are working Monday to Sunday, and we will be coming to say we've got this moral degeneration that is happening in, in our uh, country. It's because these kids are no longer spending time as family, they are no longer attending church, those who used to attend church. It's Monday to Sunday, it's school, mathematics, all the way around. And unfortunately, we can't have a country that excels in mathematics. We still have, need uh, arts, we still need sports, we still need those other uh, uh, activities that will assist these children in, in, in contributing to the economy. What is important is how we are going to contribute to the economy of this country. Whether you master maths or I, I master music, at least I'll be paying taxes and making sure that the economy of this country grows. So it's very important that we look in the way we, do, we are doing things in schools, the curriculum and these other things. If we continue with this trend, I'm telling you this country will only be having people who are going to universities and when they come back, they will not be having workplaces because it will be saturated. We are not having a, 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 a we don't have, we will not be having guys who will be playing soccer, 
We will not be having people who will be singing and entertaining us. And that is not how life it is. Uh, thank you very much. I was hoping to, to lead by example as a teacher that I take only my five minutes. Thank you. As a teacher, you only took 10 minutes. <laughs> At least you spent lesser time than the, those who came before you. I'm sure you are going to learn from a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, uh, Program Director. And, well, one thing that I've learned from the teachers uh, it's this thing called the protocol observe. <laughs> um, my name is Jerry Muneri. I'm the regional secretary of Sakao Free State and Northern Cape. We we are representing the most yeah, vulnerable workers in uh, different sectors of economy. We are representing workers who are casualized, for which a casualization in the context of South Africa, it has a face, and its face is black, that the majority of workers who are casualized in all retail stores, 99% of them, they are black. And nothing has, has happened to, yeah, to improve their, their living standard. The casualization in the, in the context of South Africa, it has gender. Yeah, it is predominantly female. Every yeah, cashier that you see yeah, at ShopRite, that you see at game stores, at Macro, at pick and pay, uh, whom they constitute 99% of all, I mean, of all your casuals uh, in that particular store, they are, they are female. Uh, this, this is a, I mean, this is a sector that uh, has age and it is predominantly young people that are affected by this. These, these are the workers, the program director, that are forced to wake up every morning at 4 o'clock for them to be at work at 8 o'clock because of the poor transport yeah, infrastructure and poor service yeah, delivery that yeah, we are yeah, confronted with in our society. These are workers that are yeah, every winter that are raped, that are killed because they are, they are forced to wake up at four o'clock to stand out there in the dark every day hoping to catch the first taxi because if they arrive one minute past eight at work, there's a, there's a warning waiting for them. The role of the state, you were supposed to ensure that it then provide you the services you that will make these workers to arrive at work on time to ensure that these workers they are safe there's a safe and reliable tri tri transport for them to arrive on time at work we are representing workers in the hospitality sector that during the lockdown, they lost a lot of wages. I will, know, I will not talk to the part that your comrade Brian uh, spoke about them. 
I will not, I will not repeat that. But many, many of them had to stay home because hotels and lodges were closed. They did not receive income. And many, many of them, they, they were not even registered. This is a sector that the government should be playing a very active role in terms of protecting those workers. And we are not seeing that yet, that protection. We are representing workers who are, who are working here in a restaurant, who are serving us every time after year we have done whatever that we, uh, I mean, yeah, we have done uh, on that particular day, but who don't even have a basic salary and, and depend yeah, on tips. And the government is not making an intervention. We have, we have made noise, but that noise has fell yeah, in deaf ears. And that worker at spare, that sometimes even government, your of, uh, I mean officials, don't respect them. They don't have, they don't have chair, they don't have a basic salary. The tip that you provide them, that is the only income that they are relying on. Others, they are even forced to you have to even pay a certain amount you have to the employer that they call a cutlery levy from here from their own tips. These these are the workers that here we are representing. The caring government has a responsibility here to intervene in that in that particular space, and we are seeing no year intervention. Because every time in that sector, including the hospitality sector, you when the MECs that are responsible for that particular sector, you convene stakeholders meeting, they always exclude, they always exclude labor. Yeah, as if labor, yeah, it's not an important player in this. We are here, we are here, we are raising these things because we, yeah, we appreciate this moment that yeah, we have received today and, and, and express yeah, our disappointment to this house for, yeah, for failing yeah, to protect yeah, the vulnerable workers. You have a moral yeah, responsibility to, yeah, to ensure that those workers, they are, they are protected. We are sitting with, with a situation where these, yeah, these workers, they are retrenched not, yeah, not because their companies are not making money. They are retrenched because their company yeah, wants to do away, their companies wants to do away yeah, with permanent yeah, employment and then introduce only casualization in all your companies where yeah, we are yeah, organized. That's why we lost so many members within the Masmat group that when we cautioned, when we cautioned uh, about 11 years ago that do not approve Walmart coming into this country, we were told that yeah, we cannot stand on the way of the uh, I mean of the uh, uh, for, uh, I mean yeah, yeah, foreign yeah, in I mean yeah, in investment. Today we are being told that because they have done away yeah, with mass cash within that yeah, that particular company, they are now dealing yeah, with mass discounters, your game stores. And within no time, there will be no company called 
mass cash. I, I mean, you must disc- must get these counters. The reason why we are raising these things, Chair, it, it, it is precisely because the manner in which the competition the commission here is behaving in terms of approving measures, yeah, and, I, 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 I mean measures and yeah, acquisition, they are so reckless in, yeah, in such a way that they don't create jobs, they destroy jobs in this, yeah, in this country. Yeah, because, yeah, because of their reckless yeah, dec- yeah, yeah, dec- yeah, decision, Today, yeah, we know, yeah, we know, yeah, we no longer have a company called Yen yeah, Ellerin's Group, and we blame no one except, except yeah, the government, because yeah, we did not receive your protection. Workers did not receive your protection. Today, workers have been sold today, they are working here for the Cambridge, they are now tomorrow being bought here by ShopRite. How then do you then explain a competition when you are monopolizing the wholesale and retail sector yet to some few big boys in that particular sector? We, we are representing this, yeah, these workers who are working yeah, in, I mean, yeah, in shopping malls. That their right to strike have been taken away. Yeah, because of the property clause. For them to strike, they are expected to go and pick it somewhere 500 meters away from their own store. They are, yeah, they are right to pick it, has been taken away. These workers, they are coming here. They have sent us to come and present. They are, yeah, they are, yeah, they, they, they are that this house, it has a responsibility yeah, to protect them. It has a responsibility yeah, to, yeah, to, yeah, to, yeah, to protect them. We are representing yeah, these, yeah, these workers. The wholesale and retail were, uh, were workers here yeah, during yeah, the, uh, I mean, yeah, the lockdown. They were forced to come to work to serve us, but they've never been yeah, recognized also yeah, as a frontline year workers. This is a sad reality. Madam Speaker, that we are yeah, we are yeah, confronted with. And it, it is our view that as, as you engage beyond this, yeah, this, yeah, this process, this country yeah, learn to, yeah, to appreciate that workers in the wholesale and retail sector, workers in the catering in the, in the industry, Workers in the hospitality service sector, they are workers too. They need your protection. It is our view that it has to be a right of workers for them yet to get, uh, uh, I mean, for them to be uh, provided a safe and reliable transport. Those who are working a early shift and those who are working a late shift. The manner in which the law it is crafted there, it's so vague to a point that it does not protect those workers. You can't from what they are earning. You just say there must be a running transport between their workplace and they are place of a residence when you don't want to commit employer to carry that, that particular cost it has to be a law employer must provide that transport and we hope we hope uh, this yeah, this session will no you will not just be your one your one of those sessions that we come and you uh, ventilate and nothing you will you will you will then happen but equally there are towns that are dying because there are no yeah, economic drivers in those yeah, in those particular towns 
and the best, yeah, the best, yeah, the best approach, yeah, Madam Speaker, and and uh, uh, yeah, the MEC of Finance. I think the best, yeah, the best model will you yeah, will be that in each and every single town, they must they must at least at least at least be your yeah, one strategic yeah, company there yeah, that will be able to create jobs yet yeah, to stimulate the yeah, economy of that particular town. Because if you go here yeah, to here yeah, to some other towns, they are I mean yeah, they are ghost towns. You go here yeah, to the vet stop, it's only Lewis and Pep. No, it's only Pep, yeah Lewis is now closed. It's only Pep stores. And 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 some uh, foreign national um, stores. You need to serious, You need to seriously. You consider that to go to those particular towns, initiate projects. Yeah, that will stimulate the economy of those particular small towns. As I conclude. Uh, we we hope that this this platform that is created today um, it will be a uh, it, it will be a, the, a, the permanent feature of this particular house and we will be able here to come each and every 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 year here to then year reflect on progress made since, yeah, since the last meeting. And I must say, what was yeah, interesting yeah, to some of us was to meet some, yeah, some, yeah, some of the comrades that yeah, we have not uh, met in a very long time. And like the Provincial Secretary of COSATU mentioned earlier, we hope this, yeah, this project yeah, will bring workers together and we, yeah, we yeah, will be able yeah, to confront challenges that yeah, we are confronted with as one yeah, uni I mean as one yeah, united force. Because yeah, a re the reality is that us continuing yeah, to counter yeah, organize each other, yeah, when, yeah, when workers are confronted yeah, with real ch yeah, 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 challenges, uh, I mean yeah, the, it is counter yeah, productive. We need to unite. We need to unite and find a way here to work together. Thank you very much. We will now give opportunity to the last affiliate and then we break for lunch. I know you are not going to start before Honorable MEC say something. No, I'm saying the Honorable MEC, she has to say something. <laughs> <laughs> if if no one is saying that, I will say Malbongwe. <laughs> where am I audible enough? Uh, where? Can someone come and assist? Thank you very much, uh, Program Director. Uh, uh, protocol observed. I don't want to waste any more time. But I'm um, Amelia Masati, not related to SAMU Provincial Secretary and COSATU Provincial Secretary. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm coming from Pop Crew, Police and Presence Civil Rights Union. We are organizing in Criminal Justice Cluster, which uh, Mekhadija can uh, contribute very positively towards the economy of the, of the free state. Uh, I'm not going to repeat what other comrades have just said with regard to the issues that are the challenges. But we need to reflect on issues that we are thinking that are of the collective bargaining in nature and are also going to assist in terms of, uh, promo uh, in terms of the economy of the, of, the, of the province. One of the issues that is a, is a real challenge, Mekhadija, is the issue of 24-7 uh, shift pattern 
uh, within the, 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 the traffic officers, of which is something that we are not going to achieve either in five years' time or in ten years' time because of the number of traffic officers that we are having in the province. Taking into consideration the conditions of our road, the challenges that we are, confront, we are confronted with. And as such is the matter that we want to bring to the attention to say this is a, a something that needs to be given an attention. Uh, in two consecutive uh, SOPA statements, there is a commitment that has been made by the government in terms of appointing traffic officers. The first one was 30 traffic officers, non-implementation of that particular matter. In the recent one was 40. Even that particular 40 speaker is not enough with the challenge that we are sitting with, with the number of traffic officers within the province. Let's go and do the study, the work study on that one. We are willing to assist, but with the number of traffic officers that we are having, that is a problem. Another problem that is a, is, a, is a real problem, and it has been raised by other affiliates. The issue of the uniform within traffic officers, that is a problem, because we are having traffic officers that, it, that they don't even have a uniform to wear. You'll see a social media that says traffic officers of free state, like hobo, they are like hobos. That is an insult to workers, and is a matter that needs to be given and the necessary attention with the speed. Uh, including the issue because remember, like we said, we are not going to be able to work issue of 24-7. Therefore, anything after 10 o'clock, Comrade Khawkhel, is, uh, is overtime. The same overtime cannot be paid because something like, uh, something like 30 percent of overtime needs to go through the office of May Khadija's office, and it remains the problem within the traffic officers. The there, there, there is this particular issue. We are not trying to turn this particular forum in the complaints forum, but these are the issues that need to get an attention. The issue of the security officers, like issues of the guard rooms, we need to provide the, traffic of, uh, the security officers with the guard rooms. They can't be able to do, remember, these people that are protecting the government state, you can't allow them to work outside because it's also talking to the safety of those particular sec security officers. I know that South African police is a national department, but we are also contributing in the, in the, in the province. There are issue of police brutality, that the, the government is very silent about it. There are issue of police, police station attacks. We had a crisis in Kofifonten, because of the infrastructure building that we are, we, are, we are having in the province. And I think this matter has been even raised by Nehau and Kosatu Provincial Secretary. The issue of uh, police attacks, police stations are attacked, and Free State we are leading, if uh, the Free State is not aware. This happens in Rettersburg, it happens in Kofifontein, it happens in Sonskein police station. Those are the police stations that we call them that are park homes. We've got the park homes in Sonskane. And if you can check the population of that particular area, uh, including the one of foreigners that we can't be able to do the calculations, our police officers' lives is in danger in everything. I will, I will, I will just raise a concern or uh, an experience. Yesterday I received a call. When you check Hopstad itself, it's more agricultural, can assist in terms of the economy of free state. But now there are a lot of robberies that are happening there. And you receive a call to say there are only one female officer in the police station at night. We know that the matter of manpower is one of the, of the uh, national, but we are saying we are raising this matter with the department. We said we are coming from the criminal justice cluster speaker, and there are things that we need to do de them jointly as COSATU and POP crew as an affiliate in terms of addressing these particular issues. The one that we, are, we, we want to call is the issue of the, uh, the crime in Daba campaign or crime in Daba, whereby, whereby all criminal justice cluster 
will be in one room with the government and share. This one will also assist in terms of dealing with the issue of corruption and fraud within our department. And I said I don't want to waste time, but other thing that is very important in closing uh, is the issue in terms of the engagement in forging the synergy of criminal justice cluster uh, system within the province. Why we are saying that? Because we could see that we, n we don't have to shy away workers to talk about the issue of crime. We don't have to show our, our way to talk to the issue of corruption. There is that particular uh, well-coordinated uh, uh, criminal activities that are coming from the uh, criminal justice cluster. Because you can't have a meeting with Pope crew prisons and we, we lock away the issue of home affairs or we don't include the issue of police roads and transport because when you check the, there's that particular synergy and we are appealing to our government to say, because like for example, when you talk about police roads and transport, we don't have to shy away. We are contributing positively to the economy of free state and we don't want us to suffer uh, MEC under, under your leadership because those are the people that we need to take care of them so that we avoid the issue of corrupt, corruption, uh, fraud and other things. But in closing we are saying we are together and uh, we, we, are com we are coming from the collective bargaining uh, of Pope Crew where we make a decision to say, as workers, we are on our own. And that statement is not innocent. Amanda, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mayor from Pope Crew. I wish we have put you and Satu first. Probably you could have influenced the others. So they started, and then they went beyond board. But it was a very uh, informative engagement. Uh, we are going to adjourn for lunch. Uh, it's, uh, al it's already 1 o'clock. We'll come back at 2 o'clock. Lunch will be served in the area here where you had breakfast in the morning. Is, uh, is it true now? Wow. I was enjoying the discussions. <laughs> so it's 2 o'clock, then we'll come back at 3 o'clock. So we'll go for lunch. Uh, we'll be led by the speaker, deputy chief whip, as well as the MEC for finance for lunch. Let's go and enjoy it and come back energized. Thank you very much. Speaker. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome back, uh, delegates. I'm sure you are more energized now. We will now 
given opportunity to serve to to come and do presentation. I don't know if um, I've switched the, the correct button, but I guess I did. Thank you very much, uh, Program Director. <clears throat> my name is Martin. Musia is my surname. I represent SAFTU. And uh, Program Director, let me start by saying uh, all protocol observed. And uh, of particular importance, let me, from this platform, thank Kosatu province, in particular Ndatema Shazi, for making sure that SAFTU is part of this process. And uh, <clears throat> having said that, let me indicate that we all know that SAFTU just emerged from its national congress whereupon we successfully elected leadership and also have had time to discuss uh, different policies and resolution in that Congress. The one that we're going to submit to this provincial legislature, its demands contained in the socioeconomic uh, section so this is our demand. <clears throat> in this section, this is a section 77, one in bracket B, notice directed to the South African government as a whole, to its components, parts named in the pages below, to organized business in general, and to the specific businesses named below. All of these parties have caused grievances to South African Federation of Trade Unions, SAFTU, members. And we therefore are calling on the government and business to heed our demands also outlined in these pages below. SAFTU is of the view that Section 77 notice required the National Economic Development and Labor Council, NETLEC, to fairly assess the socio-economic grievances expressed by SAFTU and seek a remedy through negotiations. The pages that follow represent the grievances and demands that SAFTU members are putting on record for government and business to address. <clears throat> South Africa finds itself at a precipice, the economic uh, malaise currently being experienced places the nation at a point of no return. The levels of poverty, unemployment, in particular amongst our youth and women, inequalities, corruption, crime, and etc., has reached such proportions that the, eco the country can be plunged into another civil war and strife if nothing is done. Our schools, hospitals, public transport, in particular rail, justice system, correctional services center have become dysfunctional. And members of Kasatu have raised this issue bef before us today. So it's not uh, we did not steal it, the leadership, we had it before you presented it. <laughs> As if this is not enough, our country is being battered by a wave of <clears throat> ecological crisis that creates absolute havoc through heavy storms that have left the poor more vulnerable in greater parts of the country engulfed in long spells of drought that further threaten livelihood. We all remember currently what is happening in KZN, 
people are just perishing as if they are, fly, they are flies. Food security and sovereignty, we risk losing another generation of youth to drugs and vicious cycle of crime. And comrades from Sa Sa Satu, the teachers, are raising this point sharply in their presentation. Women, including the aged, lived in fear in their homes and streets. Government is collapsing, overrun by chronism, corruption, and neglect. This point of neglect has been sharply raised by uh, Treasury in their input, in that, among others, which, is, which we find very much scandalous, that one company had to close down because the root infra infrastructure is just, uh, I don't know what is the correct word. Amongst every state-owned enterprise is facing a death spiral of financial collapse. ESCOM, South African Airways, Auto Parks, Praza are all in their knees with more workers, jobs, and services to the poor on the line. So this is a, a, a threat of you know, many workers being laid off, retrenched, and dismissed. There is a strong intention by key officials to sell the family jewels to their friends at the expense of poor, for whom these state assets are vital. Uh, this has to do with what is happening with PPEs, projects that are uh, you know, uh, mushrooming all over the country. In particular, the, the solar uh, uh, issue that is uh, cropping, cropping up in the, in the Northern Cape. Every day passes, this crisis gets worse, and suffering of our people intensifies. It is as if government officials live in wonderland. It's like they are not from here. This, all these things happen as if they don't know what is happening. Uh, one particular you know, reference, point of reference is the issue that is raised by uh, Honorable from the Department of uh, Treasury regarding the situation in, Taba, in, in Butsabelo and Kwakwa. We, 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 we surprised that issue, Kwakwa and, and Butsabelo is raised as an issue of a hub that does not exist. For instance, it's a ghost town. I don't know when last have the department visited Kwakwa. It's terrible there. There is no one single company that is operating there. It, it's, ter it's ghost. I, I don't know. I really don't know what are they raising there. Probably they, they, they're not from here. They do not see the immense suffering of our people caused by economic hardship. How many more mothers must come home to find their daughters brutally raped and murdered. How many more uh, we, we, <laughs> thanks, thanks very much for that uh, assistance. How many more children must be left to drown in pit latrin, latrines, these pit toilets? How many Michael Komapis, Komapis must there be. No sociology degree is needed to know that the terrible nightmare of women abuse, gender-based violence, and the war on women's bodies is rooted in mass unemployment and its dis disruption of traditional forms of masculinity. masculinity. While not everything occurs because of the country's economic collapse is making everything worse. Enough is enough. SAFTU is submitting this Section 77 notice following a process of intense discussion with other working class formation to start a new revolution. 
you've been raising this point that we, it's about time that we join forces uh, that will put an end to this downward spiral. We will no longer allow tinkering on the margins of the problem. <clears throat> now, section one of our demands is worker rights and crisis of representation. We are living in a society where there is a crisis of representation. What we mean is that increasingly large numbers of our people are feeling that their interests are not being adequately represented. Politicians at almost all levels remain distant and unreachable. You only see them at the time of elections when they persuade you to come and vote for them. But over and above that, you don't see them. They are nowhere to be, to be found. Hence, we appreciate this platform, Madam Speaker, once in a lifetime, an opportunity to come here and speak to you directly as workers and representing workers. We appreciate that. Decision making takes place behind closed doors and without inputs from local people and their organization. Civil society groups, groupings are viewed with suspicion when they raise the need for openness and transparency. We are embedded in a culture where announcements take place, but no engagement or active involvement. Ward committees barely function Involvement in politics is diminishing, and this serves to undermine democracy. Because if you exclude us, that is not democracy. Allow us platforms such as this, and then so that we see democracy prevailing. The danger is that effectively self-selecting elites of one description or another makes decisions for millions of people but are not held accountable. Sadly, this exclusiveness is not reserved solely for government and business, but has its reflection in the labor movement and in the, practice, in the practice, practices of section of labor who want to maintain their control and influence over institutions and structures where they are located. This is particularly true of NETLEC and of bargaining councils. SAFTU is effectively excluded from NETLEC despite the fact that it is the second largest federation in the country. Why are you excluding us? We want through you, Madam Speaker, this matter be raised so that this thing is dealt with of exclu excluding SAFTU in NETLEC. And its affiliates are excluded from particularly from particular bargaining council on the grounds that they do not meet the joining membership criteria, which are manipulated and changed precisely for that purpose. SAFTU therefore demands the following. One, on the National Economic Development and Labor Council, we say that it must be democratized. We insist on the right of SAFTU and working class formation to be represented at NETLEC, currently the only site of negotiations on national scale socioeconomic policies. Selective rules were implemented just prior to SAFTU's launch that only apply to parties outside NETLEC and which have obstructed entry. Despite the fact that NETLEC was established an act of parliament to provide a voice for all labor. As a result of this uh, restrictive uh, barrier to entry, SAFTU, together with hundreds of working class formation, united in the working class summit and in the COVID-19 People's Coalition continue to be excluded from deliberations that will impact on all of us directly. That is why we say nothing about us without us. SAFTU demands that NETLEC must remove the barriers that exclude legitimate participation of workers 
and working class organization to enable it to become truly represent, representative. Two, bargaining council must be dem democratized. Thousands of workers continue to be excluded from collective bargaining arrangements in the country. The bargaining council in particular in the public sector, which includes state-owned enterprise, are allowed by government to consistently increase the threshold of membership for those seeking membership and representation. This measure is to, is to deliberately exclude unions within the sector. While this is happening, the bargaining council imposed levies on non-membership of those workers kept outside even though in some cases there are other levies of bargaining council for the purpose of collective bargaining. While we subscribe to the principle of majoritarian, the manner in which this is applied results in the deliberation exclusion of thousands of workers. What must be noted is that the exclusion may, be, may well concentrate, uh, concentrate power and influence in the hands of particular unions, but overall it weakens power of a united working class. SAFTU demands that doors of the bargaining castle be opened so that they become more representative and less exclusive. Is a priority when workers are being put under pressure by a crisis we are in, and then and when workers unity is desperately required. Three, bargaining council agreement must be honoured and implemented. The crisis in the public sector, bargaining council, where government is prepared to use a range of measures to avoid implementing an agreement that was struck with unions in the PSBC and has caused outrage amongst workers. The very basis for our industrial relations system is being undermined by government, which is supposed to be based on free collective bargaining and crucially respect for agreements that are made. SAFTU demands that the agreement between government and public uh, sector agreement be honored by government. SAFTU rejects with contempt the imposition of wage freeze. Uh, Kosatu is raising this matter earlier before us and uh, we concur with them. We did not steal it. Once again, comrades, it's already uh, prepared. SAFTU condemns the cut of 161 billion from the wage bill of the government employees and demands its restro restoration. Uh, I, I guess unions that spoke earlier have spoken to this issue. Uh, strategically raising it that fill in the posts that are uh, existing in different uh, departments. So we have a lot in common, Dr. Uh, Masati. <laughs> SAFTU demands that all vacancies in the public service be filled without any further delays. Dinoza is, uh, is raising this sharply on their presentation. We, we concur as SAFTU. Four, worker rights are human rights. The Labor Relations Act amendments. SAFTU's view on the 2018 LRA amendments are well known. It warned that amendments are unworkable and are effectively designed to undermine worker, workers and trade union power and influence. The key problem are the amendments concerning balloting and picketing as well as the code of conduct on collective bargaining, which includes new rules about strike notices. As Safdu predicted, this since the proclamation, these amendments have had a chilling effect upon the rights to strike. They must be repealed and a dispensation which is fair and does not favor the ruling class must be introduced. On the strike ballot, 
Although in principle, employers are unable to interdict a strike because of a union's failure to comply with its constitution requiring it to ballot its members, section 67 of the labor relations. We have noticed a number of alarming developments. The register of labor relations has taken upon himself to enforce balloting by calling upon unions to produce ballot paper and other documentary or ele electronic records of the ballot. His requirement that this is done is usually when the strike begins. If the documents are not provided within his stipulated time period or the documents do not, in his opinion, comply with the strike ballot guidelines, he threatens the registration of the union. In one case, Dimausa, one union, was deregistered as a trade union. His actions are evidently biased in that he appears to primarily target uh, COSATU unions, non-COSATU non unions. Sorry, COSATU. <laughs> the Register of Labor Relations has become the employer, the employers and the employers and government activists to impose the holding of ballot as if uh, it were an explicit requirement of Labor Relations Act. Another development is that unions have been interdicted from striking because they have not yet amended their constitution requiring recorded and secret ballots before striking. The interdicts are based upon Section 19 of the Labor Relations Act Amendments Act 8 of 2018, which states that until the union complies with a directive from the Register of Labor Relations about amendments, um, about amending its constitution, it must conduct a secret ballot of members. Many unions, can, can, many unions cannot call an agent and special national congress, which is extremely costly to amend the constitution. They must wait the three or five years until the next uh, ordinary congresses, and in the meantime, run the risk of having their strike interdicted. The balloting guidelines are also overly bureaucratic. How can a ballot for an industry strike be organized without costing the union huge amounts of money? And then it must report to the Register of Labor Re uh, Relations during the strike, justifying that the ballot was in accordance with uh, balloting guidelines. These guidelines only serve to prevent poor workers and poor unions from ex exercising their con constitutional right. Interdicts meddling by the Register of Labor Relations and overly bureau bureaucratic balloting guidelines makes lawful strike extremely difficult. They promote litigation from employers who use the interdict to affect the workers' play. They create uncertainty within union members as to whether the strike is protected or not, and whether, as a result, they can be dismissed for engaging in an... They generate frustration on the ground as workers attempt to resolve their grievances are prevented through technicalities. This has motivated many workers to begin to lose faith in the legal system. In short, the amendments are a break on union activity and the right to strike, and they have become a great engine of oppression against workers and their unions. SAFTU demands that amendments and the balloting guidelines must be repealed. Picketing rule. Similarly, the new, the new provision regarding picketing rules have kept the right to picket and to strike. They have given employer many legal ways to interfere with and prevent pickets, thereby again affecting the balance of power in the, in the employer's favor. Many employers have sought and are willy-nilly granted interim interdicts requiring workers to picket hundreds of meters from the, the employer. In some cases, 
hundreds of meters from the perimeter of the employer fence. This interdict affects the power play. The effect is to render the strike less effective. They deny the right to strike and provoke the volatility of the situation on the picket line. In many of this type of application, employers complain that SAPS refuse to intervene unless and until there is a court order on that SAPS inform the employer that they, they lack capacity to respond. These complaints by employers are widespread that it appears that stock uh, paragraphs to this effect are contained in many employers attaining interdict precedents. The complaint has now become accepted as general uh, truth simply because of its relentless repetition. It is often not true. In many cases, the police are this, use these excuses as a way of not having to deal with the exaggerated complaints of the employer. These amendments have promoted a view that trade unions must play a greater role in policing their members and supporters. Policing one's member is difficult and poses the real risk that the union and its official will lose the authority and influence over their members because they become perceived as siding with the employer. It is all too easy, especially for those who have little experience of the picket line, to say that a union must control their members and support us. Now, SAFTU demands that the amendments to the picketing rules must be repealed. A fair dispensation is required, not one that promotes the interest of the uh, ruling class in their attempts to stifle, hinder uh, strikes. On the arbitration, the introduction of the advisory panel is another dramatic inroad in the right to strike. It can only be used and indeed has been used to influence the balance of power in the employer's favor. The recent referral by the plastic employer for an advisory arbitration is a case in point. The system of, of advisory arbitration only serves to Im embroil unions and their members in complicated and technical proceedings, thereby providing employers with possibility to intervene in the power play and dampen the workers' resolve to strike. The whole idea of advisory arbitration is unworkable and SAFTU demands that the amendments must be repealed. Workers' rights to a living wage. South Africa was always a very unequal country as a result of colonialism, capitalism, and apartheid. These inequalities have worsened over the past 26 years. I wish I could not have been saying this, but it's, it's the reality. Due to neoliberal economic policies imposed against the will of the working class and our allies, the COVID-19 catastrophe has amplified these inequalities. The biggest cause of these inequalities is unequal access to employment at a living wage, the skyrocketing unemployment crisis, which during the COVID-19 lockdown immediately worsened with the, reopen, the reported loss of 3 million formal jobs and 1.5 million informal jobs, and the soaring gap between pay and by worker and taken by executive, as at utterly unacceptable level, SAFTU demands the following, and inequality, policies that will dram dram dramatically reduce the, way the world's worst income and wealth, in wealth inequalities, including a generous basic income grant a renewed and enforced state moratorium on all evictions and services disconnection, 
and nation, nationalization of the commanding heights with strict exchange control imposed to prevent capital flights, pay a living wage, a monthly minimum wage at least to be 12,500, as opposed to what is in place now. Impose a maximum salary, including cuts in the salaries and other benefits enjoyed by the executive and board members of corporations, parastatal agencies, and the top layer of civil servants whose overpayment in relation to the mass of the, the, the citizenry has reached extreme proportion unprecedented in the country's history and indeed unequaled anywhere else in the world today. Reform of the political electoral system. The magnificent turnout of, of people to vote in the first democra democratic elections was our and uninspiring a, around the world and the, here at home. The picture of winding quiz waiting to vote sparked a joyous celebration. It represented the, the realization of a core demand that is the power of our people to freely elect a party to lead government. Unfortunately, the enthusiasm that accompanied that first election has all but been extinguished. If the various faction, factional fights within the established political parties reflect anything, it must be that formal politics is not primarily concerned with meeting the needs of our people, but is in, instead a joking for power and patronage. Increasingly, at election time, less people bother to vote, and even less appear to have any faith in those elected. We do not subscribe to the explanation that seeks to explain this as vote, voter apathy, as if the people are somehow to blame for the ineffectiveness of politicians. Some argue that we get the caliber of politicians that we deserve, but this too misses the point. The fact is that overwhelmingly, politicians at the national and local level do not positively relate to those who elected them, but rather, first and foremost, to the internal rhythm of their own parties. Given the present electoral system that we have, which is largely based on a list system, this is hardly surprising. Internal factional squabbles are inevitably based on factional advantage, tied to power or wealth, and not on meeting the needs of constituencies. Safe to believe it is time to critically review the current electoral system, and especially the relationship between elected representative and the people they claim to represent. For this reason, we are embarking on a research study to evaluate models of representation that will shift the emphasis of accountability towards the people as, proposed, as opposed to party bosses. The recent constitutional ruling challenging the party system of undermining the right of individual to contest election could provide an opening for such a discussion, and it must be grasped with both hands. SAFTU demands NETLEC to invite inputs and contributions to an inclusive and open discussion on how best to ensure that those elected can be made directly accountable to those that elected them, and that this should take place within the next three months. On the state economy, state of the economy, the need to overall the economy. The South African economy can be lucrative, one, if you are wealthy. But if you are poor, it will impoverish you further. South African capitalist has become incapable of meeting even the most basic needs of its people. 
a visit to any township. And we, we invite you, Madam Speaker, to do that. Just visit one township and see what is happening there. Or informal settlement. You know, there is one here called uh, it's not, it, it used to be called Dinawe, but it's now Kaleb Mutsavi. Uh, we invite you to just venture into, into that area and see what is happening there. We'll provide the harsh evidence of what the majority of our people experience on a day-to-day -day basis. A neoliberal approach to the economic entrenches rather than liberate the exploitative practices. The particular development of capitalism in South Africa has left behind a legacy of long-term chronic inequality, unemployment, and poverty. In fact, the success of capitalism in South Africa have been deepened on the continuing impoverishment of the working class and the poor. It has, it has never worked for the mass of its people, but has unwavering maintained the wealth and privilege of the elite. This may have been marginally changed by boardroom black empowerment, but it has no, not fundamentally altered or challenged the power and wealth of those who control the economy. And through that, to influence the political, the political direction of our economy. This is why SAFTU demands that the South African economy be overhauled to rid itself of the vestiges of racism and colonialism that continue to shape the economy. This has been acknowledged as recently as May 2020 by the president to a meeting of news editors. Currently, the economy suffers from combination of super exploitative services and petty trade, a withering manufacturing sector worth about half the contribution to the GDP it, it, it was in 1994. A mainly parasitic financial sector and often paralyzed state sector, a near debt construction sector, an erratic agricultural sector, vulnerable to climate uh, crisis, and the continuing extraction of mineral with barely any beneficiation to the local economy, so that we have to rebuy products from other countries made with our raw material. We demand a staff to, uh, that acknowledge and respect historic demands to share society wealth made by generations of workers, peasant, women, youth, and other social movements, including political parties. The banks and other corporations should be placed under public ownership. Simple technical ownership of mineral is obviously not enough. The 1998 Mineral Act did restore public ownership of the wealth beneath the ground. Yet, at the same time, hoodwinked society into relying upon multinational corporations to extract those minerals for the common goods. The corporations abject failure to allow uh, redistribution of wealth and to reinvest properly for longer term development is a lesson for all. Our national wealth simply cannot be left in the hands of those whose primary purpose is the private accumulation of capital. The wealth these corporations now control must be expropriate, expropriated so as to make resources available for social use, useful programs, especially those aimed at poverty alleviation, gender equity, employment, and environmental restor restoration. Reverse the de deliberating, delib de debilitating self-destruction impact of private property relations. To meet these needs of our people now, in the future, we need emergency legislation to bring the main banks, the mines, 
the monopoly industries into public ownership under democratic worker and community control and management. The agency has never been greater. The later Reserve Bank statistics for the current account deficit show massive offshoring of profits resumed in the second quarter of 2020, thus reversing the first current account surplus in 17 years. This was made worse by government resorting to the International Monetary Fund in August 2020, and this threatening the sovereignty of South African policy making and implementation more difficult. It is urgent to halt profit outflows and fully audit external debt. The damage done by banking, and especially the facilitation of, the, of what Treasury admits is uh, 10 to $25 billion in illicit financial flows. That involves mining and other major industries. We need not only return to the 1994 Reconstruction and Development Program, which we fear is yet another hollow promise within the, uh, the ruling party's latest economic plan. We need the introduction of an economic plan based on the needs of the poor and working people, with a special reference to our young people, women, the vulnerable, and our environment and not the continuing accumulation by billionaires. Reorganize all economic life on the basis of democratically planned economy. It remains vital to remove obstacles associated with private property rights, such as those preventing lo lo logical planning in urban areas due to the power of the real estate industry, or holding the redistribution of vitally needed healthcare resources within an apartheid-style health insurance and healthcare system. Our society and its economy is distorted by the profit motifs, and this has prevented meeting the formidable public health, economic, and social environmental needs of our people. Break up the monopolies. Government must study and implement the recommendation arising from research funded by the Department of Trade and Industry and conducted by the University of Johannesburg Center for Com Competition, Regulation, and Economic Development. They have established that there has been increasingly corporate concentration leading to anti-competitive behavior. More importantly, they found that the cash reserves in the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, its largest 50 companies, had increased from 242 billion to 1.4 to 1 trillion between 2005 and 2016. Government must aggressively tax all companies that are boarding wealth that should be invested for the common good force firm to invest in the domestic productivity economy, tighten the exchange control, reintroduce prescribed asset, and generate new state uh, securities that compel the fast liquid capital in South Africa to flow in the real economy, especially to rebuild our manufacturing and construction industries for ecological conscious infrastructure, especially aimed at meeting basic needs. Renationalize steel. It is well known that ArcelorMittal, which used to be state-owned ESCO in the past, has abused the economy through its pricing and milking of the assets sold to Lakshmi Mittal in 2003. By nationalizing this firm, the state can gain produce steel that is, okay, can again produce steel that is inexpensive and vital to development, uh, the country's in, uh, unequal distributive infrastructure, and to feed downstream industry with local production. 
rational, rationalize petrochemical oil and gas. Sasol, which has been allowed to not only privatize but spend more than 250 billion to build a failing white elephant complex in the United States of Louisiana, must be rationalized so that it can contribute to rather to rather than undermine the transition to a genuinely decarbonized green economy. And for example, in the interim, provide inexpensive fertilizer to, perm to permit uh, agrarian reform and pro promote enable food sovereignty. Promote appropriate uh, R&D, the fetish with the fourth uh, industrial revolution has done enormous damage already by fueling fantasies of global competitiveness. In a sector that is fraught with danger, e.g. robotics uh, dominating human life, with surveillance and civil liberty threatened and halting e tolls, uh, and with emphasis on intellectual property rights. In reality, many parts of South Africa cannot claim to even have experienced a first industrial revolution involving basis, agricultural and transport, not to mention electricity, clean water, access to technology. Much of South Africa is vulnerable to ESCOM's load shedding, a problem we are told will last many years longer. The attention being given to the fourth industrial revolution in its current form is misplaced, and we need instead a clear program to support the most urgently needed components of government's industrial policy action plan through a more vigorous and aggressive approach to appropriate uh, R&D. Re-establishment the vast mineral wealth into society hands there was an estimated 42 trillion rands worth of platinum, gold, iron ore, and other available mine minerals in South Africa. According to a Citigroup study in 2011, the International Monetary Fund found in 2018 that among countries with reliable data, only five had more financial and non-financial assets than South Africa. Since 1994, it is undeniable that the government has served the interest of mining capital, including a handful of black entrepreneurs, and has failed society, our government, and future generations. Mining in South Africa was fundamentally based not only extracting national resources, e.g. half the world's gold, and exporting the profits, but also on cheap migrant labor whose subsidization by unpaid women's labor reached extreme level of super exploitation. To a larger extent, both the uncompensated extraction from our soil and abuse of migrant worker continues to this day. Colonial and apartheid objectives were to extract as much mineral wealth as possible and to divide and conquer the, the, the workforce so as to prevent the African majority from becoming anything other than subjugated class. Honorable Musia, I give you two minutes to wrap up. Oh. Yes. Okay. And you can submit the document if there are some issues that you still want them to be reflected on our board. Then okay. No, I guess it's, it's best that I submit because I still have a lot on my plate. Okay. So <laughs> you, can just, you can just wrap up. Just two minutes. Yeah. No, no. Let, let me just wrap up. Well, I, I commit um, uh, pro program director to submit this document because it's a, it, it covers a, a whole range of issues 
that uh, are, are affecting our society. So I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up, I'll, I'll say thank you very much, having allowed me this opportunity to, pre to present from this podium, and I'll submit this as demands of uh, SAFTU on behalf of uh, SAFTU members and the working class broadly. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Musia. And now it's an opportunity now for SAF to affiliate. Can I, I just recognize one hand, one, two, three, four, five hands, six hands. So at least it's a, it's a balance, six, six. We can uh, ascend to the podium in that order. Thank you, Program Director. All protocol observed. Uh, director, uh, Program Director, I am just going to talk about the challenges we faced at the workplace. Your name and the name of the family. Okay, uh, thank you very much. My you. name is Geneva, the same name is Bojang. I am from Litau. Democratized Transport and Allied Workers Union. Uh, program director, I thought Mayor Brown will be here from his uh, speech. I noted that crucial, uh, crucial statements from his speech, and because after work, I am a community member. I felt it's, it was very important for me to talk about that, particularly the basic need, which is water. As we, we, we are all aware that Tabo Mufutsanyan is having a serious problem uh, with water. I'm talking about Tabo Mufutsanyan because I am from Tabo Mufutsanyan, program director. Let me start by saying, Program Director and the Speaker, every time we will be told that employment decline, whereas employment has been taken by the foreigners, our people, particularly the people in the free state, are not working because their jobs are being taken by the foreigners. Our people will remain unemployed as long as our province does not take its people, does not pri prioritize its people. Foreign companies or shops are employing Lesotho people. I, it's not that uh, comrades and, and uh, I don't know, what, what do we call you when we are in parliament? Honorables. Uh, it's not that I am negative, but here I think we need to put the facts straight. The shops in town go in Bloemfontein on the, at the downtown. You'll find that the people who are working there are Lesotho nationals. We are pleading, Speaker, that at least preference be given to South African citizens. As we normally say, charity begins at home. I don't think the, the work that they are doing at the shop, it's a skilled job that cannot be done by a South African citizen. Uh, Madam Speaker, no, Speaker, even in the road freight companies, we are having foreign nationals that are working there. We are having agents of bargaining cancer who supposed whose their jobs is to monitor. But if you check, you find that the South African people, if the company employed 10 people, 
three are South African, seven are foreign nationals. Because the companies believe that foreign nationals, they are cheaper than the South African. Our provincial government gave tenders to security companies. Most of them are fly-by-night. Program director, I am very happy to be invited in this workers' parliament because the security guards or security officers are the members of the town. It is disgusting to find that the very same security officer who are working under a, a certain company or employed by a certain company secure government buildings. But at the end of the month, these workers are not get paid. Every time when you ask the employer, the employer will say, the government, the government have not yet pay me. So the question is, who is the employer in this case? If the employees are being told that the government have not paid the, the, the tender, then let the government from the money of tendering, let the government pay the security officer. The poor workers are expected to report for duty the following day, and neatly so. Honorable Speaker, I believe for the government to invite us in this parliament, is to ensure that at least the government uh, try to alleviate the problems that we the problems that we are facing at the workplace. Load shedding affects workers negative as they are not paid for the hours that low shading was, was in place. So we also, on that uh, speaker, request that the government intervene. I don't know how, but maybe you'll be able to, to intervene. In, in our province, we have sectors that are ship sharing and when you check that sector ship sharing the sector is not formalized the sector employs people from lesotho the sector train people from lesotho to be the ship sharer so we are saying let the government intervene we have so many people in the settlement area where most of them they are from the farms it is advisable if the government goes out to the people and say to the people, there are ship sharers, let the government take stand. Let the government try to intervene and uh, assist people. Some of the people, they believe ship, ship sharer is not a job. It's, it's, a, 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 it's a skill job, uh, uh, speaker. And we request that in that uh, job, let the South African be employed. Again also, let the government go to people and tell people about the agriculture. It's a job. It's not that there is no job in South Africa. There is job in South Africa. There is job in, in, in Free State. Though the job is not so much high, but most of the job are being, uh, uh, foreigners are being accommodated in those jobs. So it is important for us to highlight that uh, speaker so that our people be employed in that. In closing, speaker, uh, one may think we are turning this workers' parliament a complaint forum, but the truth is that we raise the challenges uh, believing that uh, or hope that it will be alleviated by the government. I thank you. We can get another affiliate, the next one. Uh, 
thank you, Speaker. My name is Vuyani Mbangwa. I'm the Provincial Secretary of Food and Allied Workers Union in Free State and Northern Cape. Uh, Madam Speaker, within our scope of organizing, we have what we call food and beverage manufacturing. And this is one area where we have experienced a decline in growth and suffered job losses over the years. And one of the contributing factors is illicit economy. The goods traded illicitly are wide range and include, amongst others, soft drinks, beverages, tobacco and cigarettes, sugary and sweetened candies, white spirits of alcohol, and many others. And we are raising this, Madam Speaker, for the sake of our jobs, health of our people in the province, and revenue to the fiscals. When we talk about revenue to the fiscals, whatever, is, whatever that is produced in our country, certainly in areas of food and drinks, must elicit tax compliance or must be produced in conditions of full declaration on volumes and complete tax compliance. And when we talk about health and healthy food, drinks and others, goods produced must meet the health, hygienic and other quality standard. And thirdly, when we talk about, for the sake of our jobs, uh, as a union, we are interested in local jobs. It's given that illicit, illicit products will lead to decline in sales in legitimate companies, and as a result, companies will have no option but to embark on Section 189. But in responding to this challenge, Madam Speakers, we know that Honorable Makalo Mohale embarked on a clampdown campaign sometime last year in Butsabelo. Although we welcome the efforts by the Honorable Makalo, we are saying a once-off event will not be adequate enough to confront and cap the extent of illicit economy in our province. And operating in silos with no benefit of those specialized in other areas may not result in increased efficiencies. And there is a need for a singular approach to be abundant in favor of multidisciplinary approach mobilized in special task forces. The Ministry of Health does not enjoy as many and as much competencies in enforcing existing current health policies, especially the ones regulating uh, to the manufacturing. We can make examples of the outbreak of listeri listeriosis. Those with uh, competencies in local municipalities may not have such capacity or their preoccupations may be with service delivery on areas of housing, roads, and other delivery priori pri priorities for residences than on health and hygiene. What is more critical, Madam Speaker, is uh, all relevant stakeholders must be coalesced into a specialized multidisciplinary task force in order to clamp down on illicit products in our province. This multidisciplinary task force will be able to get programs unfolding into preventative activities, whether at SARS uh, or at the steer, police, local municipal municipal law enforcers, and many others, like investigations into current contraventions, detectives or of wrongdoing, intelligence, gathering into planned transgressions, and enforcement of the laws as they exist. So, Madam Speaker, what we want to suggest uh, is that in order to clamp down on these illicit products, all these relevant stakeholders must come together and establish a task force that will mainly focus on clamping down on this illicit economy. Thank you very much. The next affiliate. Thank you, uh, Program Director. And uh, I must as well comply that I must observe the protocol. 
as, as other honorable members have done. Yeah, basically what we, 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 we will be talking to, because a number of issues have been covered by... Your identity, please. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm Jihad Onya. I'm from Salipsu. I'm the Deputy Secretary General. Thank you. We, we, we want to speak on the issue of uh, bargaining cancer, uh, Honorable Speaker, which is quite important. Because uh, we believe that uh, the, the, the cancer, the bargaining processes are extremely compromised in this country. We can cite two examples. We made an analysis of the bargaining processes from around 1995 until 2015, various uh, uh, collective agreements. We, we can remember that around 1999, there was, a, there was a unilateral implementation by the government, irrespective of the unions, not agreeing to it. And we also observed that the last agreement, the government also reneged and unilaterally took decision not to implement. And to add more salt to the wound, it even went out to use the powers of courts to actually cement that particular approach, which was saying it is it is actually compromising and killing and collapsing the bargaining council. And we take tune. If I may just make an example, when you analyze, particularly the issue of austerity programs, one will cite an example of Greece, Greece as a country, which adopted austerity programs. And what actually obtained from such uh, austerity programs are the following, which I, I believe they are similar to South Africa. One, it was collapse of the bargaining council in Greece, where government unilaterally took decisions, which actually happened in this country. The society in Greece were facing serious food prices and energy going up and salaries going down which fundamentally there's no improvement in terms of salaries again in the country, which are witnessing both private and public sector. And the issue of bargaining council, on the basis of taking tune from the government, the private sector as well started. We are seated with Clover, we are seated with a uh, mining sector. There are serious problems that are actually rearing their ugly head today. The rising of unemployment. That is what was happening in Greece and is currently happening in this country. So it shows that instead of actually uplifting because it comes with a strict structural adjustment programs decided upon by IRS as to how to run your country, it means it compromises the sovereignty of the country. As we speak, the country is compromised. It is sovereignty is compromised because one, it owes too much, almost trillions of money, which is the services, uh, honorable uh, MEC of, uh, of uh, finance or treasure has actually alluded to that. So we are raising that particular. The amendment of labor laws, that is what was experienced in that country. And we experienced it here. And it was unilateral. And the gains that were actually, you know, it becomes a problem, uh, Madam Speaker, when the champions of these labor laws actually are out of we don't know what, then be decided to change and take a particular trajectory. It becomes a problem. So that's why we are worried about that. The budget cuts, extreme budget cut. You go to education, for instance, it's budget cut in terms of infrastructure. And the, mean, and the, and the MEC, of, at, uh, MEC of finance alluded to that fact, that a company has to move because of 
uh, serious infrastructure challenges. You go to education, schools, it's a problem. I'm sure more than 100 schools in Eastern Cape had to, had to be closed because of, government, of, 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 of cuts, which actually led to one thing, increase in terms of teacher-learner ratio, which became a problem. And at the same time, we are, taking, we are talking about improving standard of education. We want to be on par with other international role players. That becomes a fundamental contradiction in terms of our policy trajectory. That is the issue that you are raising. Inequalities, we spoke about inequalities that are quite acute. And it brings again to the issue of bargaining and bargaining strategies. For instance, in bargaining councils, we find a situation that after a deal is signed and a collective agreement is signed, uh, the nature of the collective, collective agreement would say uh, it's across the board. Across the board arrangement is one strategy that even the, the United and uh, Organized Labour should actually consider. It means you are maintaining status quo and it means inequalities are there to stay. At some point when you analyze, like I said, uh, the collective uh, agreements from, 20, from 1995 to, uh, to, to, to the last one, there were instances where an agreement was to say on sliding scale, and in particular, a uh, 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 Madam Speaker was actually trying to mitigate these acute uh, inequalities that we uh, began to, 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 to actually see. And another point that is raised, that is very key for bargaining council. How do you ensure that, because we have the higher echelons, we have, we have individuals that are occupying higher echelons of administration and bureaucracy. How do you ensure that with a serious PECs, outside power balance, it's, 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 it's not, uh, Madam Speaker, it's not equal in that bargain. Uh, one honorable uh, uh, member here uh, uh, defined what is uh, a bargaining council, what is bargaining. But then I said, to me, it seems as if bargaining is like watching a soccer game where the referee and the other officials are wearing similar kits like a, like opponent team. And then the power balance becomes different because you can't see referees wearing the same team, the same color with the other team. So it means uh, you know, consolidates this other team and other officials. So that is what you're exposing to. That is what you're exposed to. Those are the issues on bargaining. And the other issue that is very critical, uh, 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 program director, is the issue of outsourcing and insourcing. Uh, we will reflect on this particular matter. On two, there was a commitment to begin a process of insourcing, which was made around 2009 by MTSF, and in 22 by public sector agreements, and at a later stage consolidated by the ANC manifesto. When you visit that manifesto of 2014, you'll see it spoke extensively about the insourcing, but that never found expression on the ground. Because as we speak now, we we'll just try to demonstrate. When you check, for instance, in education, we talk, we'll talk to education, talk to policing and health, for instance. When you check on health, the issue of fleet and transport, it's outsourced. When you check the issue of health care and risk waste, it's also outsourced. Why is it at the same time we said we need to outsource so that we have the better and you know, uh, you know, job, uh, uh, job for individuals? The issue of laundry with health is also outsourced. How do we ensure that we arrive at that particular contents of manifesto of 2014 and other related agreements on that? When you shock on policing, guarding of government buildings, buildings building maintenance, vehicle fleet management, vehicle pounding, information technology services, gardening, catering, and laundry, provision of prisoners' meals, all those are outsourced. How do we ensure that? Because, you know, outsourcing actually says it's, a, it's another way of continuous, uh, you know, uh, casualization. And then there's no permanent job. When you go to education as well, we are, we are observing a number of issues there. The in-service in teach, teacher training, 
it's one area. That is a problem. Development of curriculum and learning material. Who are the role players there? Even those people who are delivering the very same, they are not, they are less participating. They are just giving to say, this is what you must do. Their contribution. So how do we ensure that we strengthen the bargaining castles to actually ensure that it deals with such issues? Training of school managers and governors. It is, it's an outsourced uh, exercise. How do you ensure that it is? It doesn't mean before then there wasn't any capacity to ensure that. Hence, uh, 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 Madam Speaker, we are saying how do we ensure part of uh, you know, challenge you are confronted is how to ensure that the state capacity is increased so that it addresses issues that are confronting the society. So that is very critical. Facilitation of school improvement and institutional rationalization processes. Those areas of functionality are also outsourced. How do you ensure? Those are some of the issues. Project management at, and conducting of adult basic education. Those are some of the issues that are, are, are how do you ensure? Particularly um, the higher echelons. And also, there are unnecessary individuals in the bureaucracy. How do you ensure that? So that we have equal distribution. How do you ensure that all unnecessary, you know, functions in terms of bureaucracy are dealt with so that we don't, uh, you know, the expenditure. Because there is this saying uh, that is confronting public sector, which in public sector is bloated, the, pay, the, wage, the wage bill, it's, it's, it's big and whatever and whatever. But nobody has actually told any forum. When we say public sector, uh, 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 what is the size in actual fact of public sector? Scientifically speaking, can anybody stand up and say this, is, this should be the size of public sector? There's nothing of that nature. Because even in smaller and emerging economies and middle class and middle earning economies, we have public sector that is bigger. When you talk about, for instance, when you check in Norway, if I'm not mistaken, and, and, and another country, I just forgot it, uh, where they are predominantly a welfare is the same. Because it mitigates and that increases the buying power. That increases the buying power. And, it increase, and, and it because it's independence from you know, a, a welfare kind of an approach. Because currently, we are gradually heading to that a welfare state because of employment and other related matters. So we are, we are speaking on those, the issue of, and then we are proposing some of the issues here to say, look into the issue of wealth tax. How do you ensure that those who are wealthy are taxed? How do you ensure that, for instance, in 1994, corporate tax was around 50, 58, around evasive in terms of paying tax. Those are the areas. How do you ensure that that one is evasive in terms of paying tax. Those are the areas. How do you ensure that that one is improved in terms of uh, SARS uh, you know, uh, operations? That is what you are looking for. Uh, and also review the personal, like we, we, we spoke on it, the review of the personal tax is also key because uh, there are those who should you know, pay more than uh, others are paying. And uh, because poor people are paying tax almost every day through VAT, which was increased. When you go to a shop, when you go 10 times, you're going to pay tax 10 times. So that is, what, that is the scenario. How do we ensure that we restructure our tax base and ensure that it serves the purpose that it should serve in terms of ensuring that it emancipates uh, uh, the people? And in, in, in closing, uh, one honorable member, honorable uh, uh, Jerry Muneri, raised the issue of a caring society. So we are living this particular forum with, is it possible to actually have a caring society in a capitalist trajectory? So that is the question that we need to answer in our own corners. And maybe when we meet next time, we are aware and say, no, it's possible to, to create a caring society in a capitalist uh, mode of production. Thank you, uh, uh, Honorable. Program director and uh, speaker. Thank you very much. The fourth one, the floor is yours, sir. honorable member. Yeah. 
mangtatele tuba ngbulise as an Africa month zoteta orongzo kulumisizu ngbulise o program director ngbulise nentu yonke kanye no mama o speta o speaker Yeah, no. We are sorting out. Okay. Yeah, bo. Angere ngbe motera ngara para tenzi ni kamala mungutse po isbongo ngushaluk. Ni tupi chepesin e province e nupso. Intenzo ikulu malana njek pela uguti bestrela la penzi ni mam. Joba Usbizile wote sizo kulimisa na singama singama inyon. Intesi tinga yo sitinga njia kupela wote gubeno kusebenzi sana no government wetu kanya na ma private sector. One, esi pete tina si nupso. Si kuluma nge department lo kutuwa i police road and transport. Laguna kona ama security anga na uniform. Si testela baba nige si uniform. Uh, Spinde city number two school meng ma CSW as a noobso. Sitting ama CSW we province young Elena we free state. Baba crash a permanent so Jongaba Watembisa U Mama U Premier Abate Taba is a pet lem twenty eighteen. Ati Baza Ukrashua permanently so but since Namanja Baga crash was Pumugio Piquet Alapana. Office in La Cascara Tolling Shone Nempendlo, a right, a yacht. Three, police road and transport again. The maintenance as a police road and transport, I'm a building up a filler wonk, our sevens, Maraba sevens, but to be able to look at sevens, I will let so simo essential. Gungana case, Gungana man, Gule Covid, Esguyole. Sitting a woot in Jabonara, the rooting and Pella, Lentes is a lela, is a Wenzera, a speaker. Four, good ama security. Aba winner, a case penal sock. In a woo pillar, a corner life from Fountain. Narsok, a old age, a tavage. Number six, <coughs> Medi Clinic, Nebusa Med. Sitting about Pata Labantugas, about Pata Ligas. Gunabans Lulu Corner, and I will corner Lapoles window. Number seven, Iserenic Abato. Last is a corner, Woti, Gunomonio, Ola Papesu, La Pacona, La Parliamentin. Una mashes la po patabantu la babantu ba holy la po. Aguna danger allowance. Aguna medical scheme. Aguna si sho i i transport allowance. Uma banga pula izinto la pamoja zia patalo. Le mishini le inga pua kutoa patala ba sebens. And I see into a right long of us as what young kin to a corner lapa is sure. Massibuya manja sukuluman abogenda was what Bapam Seraba Sebenzi Malabachalang national minimum wage. Born and Jenny Campan Aguna Malabai Farai, Bachelang national minimum wage. Stella Bazdung is because Labo Bandabana is on a provident fund. Number eight Sbuyelo PRT. I'm at Linasa corner since Baka looks seven Zabanya be Baba Susa public works Baba let hang up Baba adopt since Bashe level in a one level two. A Sikabangut Nababa de Seva Mababa Enza Leandao Isale in Nugela Ram Nandi a bad de Seva would Baparani sell you Ama level up. See a Kela would lend to Lena against Nate and Joba Sestali Lessi engage the 
fifth one. Uh, thank you, Program Director. Thank you, Honorable Members. I must say I'm very fortunate to come here and stand representing workers. I'm a shop steward from the plant level. My name is Yabata John. I'm from NUMSA. Honorable Members, I'm rising on one point because uh, many speakers who came before me they have demonstrated our position as sub to delegates. But I'm raising one point, which I think is a critical issue, which is a burning issue. And I'm, I think uh, our leadership are listening very careful to what I'm going to express, because it's indeed a very painful chapter that I'm going to open. Leadership, we are appealing to the free state leadership to listen to the workers. There is an issue of transport. Majority, I think it's, it's a common cause, uh, honorable members, that Free State is one of the provinces that is above with unemployment. It's one of the provinces which is above with poverty. I'm raising this issue today, comrades. I'm sorry, honorable, honorable members, to say we have a very serious challenges. We do not have any alternative transport here in Bloomfield, in Free State in, in particular. There has been an issue which has been discussed. We have been told that the government will intervene in trying to, or the government transport, as an alternative. Because we do not have any alternative, but we are compelled to use interstate. The pity part is that the interstate is being subsidized by the government. But interstate is increasing its tariffs every year. Even now, there's a notice from interstate that they are going to increase the tariffs. Hence, on the other side, the workers are not getting increase. There's a standstill, there's a zero percent from the employers. I want to raise this point to say to our leadership, let us prioritize the workers' needs. Because we indeed came here with the mandate of the workers. We want to appeal to the leadership to say, we've been told by the, uh, 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 the leadership to say, they are going to, to be an alternative for transport. But instead, there's only transport which are, we are using as a, 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 tra a transport which is interstate. And interstate is increasing every month, leadership. We want to appeal to the, to the leadership to provide the workers with alternative transport, which can be affordable and cheaper to the working class and the poor. Because it's a common cause in Free State, we are poor comrades. Everyone knows about that fee. And I'm, I, I'm hoping that the leadership are listening to us, because this mandate are coming from the, the workers and the poor comrades, to say we need an alternative transport. We must not be compelled to use only interstate, but there must be alternative, like in, uh, in other provinces, we, the, where they have uh, the BRT, there's a train as an alternative. But here in Bullfontein, we've been told that there's going to be a train, there's going to be a municipal buses. But so far, we are still waiting for those transport. We don't know what is happening, because in the previous, we have seen buses coming to the airport, which we have been told there are municipal buses, but where are they now? We don't know. But our position as sub to delegate is that we are making a, a clarion call to the government to prioritize the workers and the, the poor in providing an al alternative transport which can be affordable to us all comrades. So that is our position as sub to delegates to say, government, let's prioritize the alternative transport. So I cannot go any further because of uh, the speakers who came before me, they have expressed our position. And I thank you all, honorable members. Thank you. The last uh, affiliate from SAF2. Uh, thank you, program director. 
and good afternoon. Uh, program director, I'm actually not going to be long because most of our, uh, the affiliates, they have spoken and I think their voices are heard. But what we want to put on top from the mandate... Identity, please. Oh, <laughs> I, I was coming to that. <laughs> uh, I'm Felicity Lekete, the Interim Deputy Secretariat of SAFTU, standing here on, on behalf of SAFTU, just to give one point to, to the House, Madam Speaker. Uh, SAFTU is appealing to Parliament to create regulations that demand the enforce of its laws, like the Labor Relations Act, in which collective bargain council and collective agreements are entrenched. It's a product of parliament. Parliament must therefore protect it as a transformatory piece of legislature. Uh, we just wanted that to be on record. Thank you, Madam Speaker. No, it, it was, I think we still have the last one. It was only just an addition from the main presentation done by SAFTU. So the last affiliate from SAFTU is the one coming. Uh, thank you, uh, House Chairperson. Uh, my name is Leso Honolo Nyatanyane. I'm from South African Police Union. So, Chairperson, you don't have to police my time. I will police it myself. Uh, no, you can't be a player in a reference <laughs> center. So, uh, someone must police. Um, Remember, we are dealing with accountability uh, at the legislature. Yes, I'm, uh, <laughs> I was just saying uh, to demonstrate that we still have effective policy. So, I will police my own time. <laughs> <coughs> uh, it's a pity, Chairperson, that uh, the MEC of, of Finance is no longer with us here, but I, I hope through you and the Madam Speaker the, the message will be conveyed. Mm. Uh, I heard uh, the MEC talk about investment and infrastructure and all of those things. When she was speaking about investment, uh, attracting international investors and building the economy through infrastructure development. I wanted to raise the matter of Park Road police station with her. This is the largest police station in Free State, which has been under renovation from 2017. It is still under renovation even today. It will still be under renovation even next year. Now, how do you attract investment? in a province where the largest police station has been under renovation for close to a decade. The first thing that the investors want to hear is how safe is your province? What is the, 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 the level of crime? Now, the workers at that police station are demoralized. Every day somebody is, is demolishing a wall, the other one is building here, then there's earth moving equipment all over the place. Even the station management doesn't know when will the project be completed. I know SAPS is not a, a provincial competency speaker, but uh, the police station is operating in, in, your, in your province. So somebody from public works or from SAPS national office must account. Even the construction, is not supposed to last for a decade, let alone a renovation. A renovation is a touch-up here and there. It can take a decade. Another thing is the state of our road. We say we want to in, uh, attract investments, but when, when those investors arrive and the workers have to commute to work, on what roads are we going to commute? We don't have roads in Free State. In Free State, we've got, we've got potholes on every road. When you try to avoid, you, you, you can't even avoid the, 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 the potholes. It's just a matter of choosing which one to fall into. 
you, you can't avoid them. You, ju you just have to park a little bit and say, this one looks better than that, that one. Let me drive into this one. Because that, that is the state of our hood. Uh, Chairperson, uh, in end of June this year, I'm going to, to renew my, my license disc. When I renew the disc, they say I must renew that disc every year to pay for the roads that I use. For my car to travel on these roads, I must pay the disc every year. I'm going to pay 500 and something at the end of June. Two weeks later, I'm going to pay 900 rand to buy a new tire because my car will be damaged by the very same road that I paid for. That is the, the, the state that we are living under, uh, Madam Speaker, as workers. With the little money that we get, we renew the disc today to pay for the road. Two weeks later, you have to fix the car because it is damaged by the same road that, that we are paying for. When we are lucky, your, 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 your vehicle will get damaged by the road. At worst, you might even die as a worker commuting to work because of the state of our roads. So we need government to, to please come to our level, work with the workers, try to, to check the conditions under, under which we work. We, the, the workers of this country are al already under stress from the employers and all other living conditions. The, the least we want to be stressed with is small things like fixing a pothole here and there. Then another one, very critical. Uh, as workers, I think all of us are, are, are united as, as federations and trade unions in, in the fight against casualization and exploitation of workers. Uh, Madam Speaker, we don't expect the government to be in the forefront of exploiting workers. We don't expect the government to be in the forefront of casualizing workers. We have had EPWP workers. These EPWP workers, are, are, you don't know whether they are casual workers or permanent workers. Initially, they, 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 it was said EPWP workers would work for six months or 12 months, then they will find permanent employment for them, blah, blah, blah. Then you find the same person has been EPWP worker for three years, then the other one has disappeared, then there are internships at government departments, an intern is there for 12 months, then they disappear, there comes another intern, then they disappear. I hope, Madam Speaker, next year when we converge here again, the, the, the MEC of Finance will account to us and say, tell us exactly how many interns have we had in the free state from whenever the project was started. How many interns have we had? How many do we have currently? What budget have, have, have we used so far for the interns? Those that have exited the system, where are they now? Can we trace them? Are, are they ab absorbed by government departments? Are they absorbed by municipalities? If not, if they are still out there, where out there are they? What are they doing? The same with EPWP workers. Those that have exited the system, where are they now? Then the other one that uh, the comrades touched on is collective, collective bargaining system which is under attack by the very same government that must protect it. The government reneged on the 2018 uh, resolution, just like that. And the mistake that we made as workers of all federations, the mistake that we made when the government reneged on the agreement was that the federations rushed to court to hold government to account. We shot ourselves in the foot by rushing to court. There's one union that I like, Madam Speaker, Kesamu. 
You know what Samu does? They don't have time to rush to court, CCMA, blah, 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 blah. But Kala Matagala Strati, Maspala Wafachelet. Just like that. Now, the public sector unions, they went to court. They went to court to negotiate salaries. You don't negotiate salaries in court, never. That is the, the very mistake that we made. Because when you go to court, a judge will issue a judgment. Once a judgment is issued, you have to comply with the judgment. If you don't comply with the judgment, then you are in contempt of court. Once you go there, you bind yourself or whatever the outcome, I will abide by it. Then you come back and uh, the outcome is not satisfactory. Then what do you do? You have lost. You have failed your members. So all the federations, we must guard against that. What, what uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the federations should have done was to come back to the workers and lead us to the picket line. We would be having our, our salaries now and the salary increments and everything. Not a judge telling us that, uh, no, government says he doesn't have money, then finish and laugh. Meanwhile, the, 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 the government has not presented its balance sheet and the bank statements to the judge. The judge just says, the government doesn't have money, go home. And then we are bound to comply uh, with the judgment. Now, we need to redefine the future of collective bargaining system. It is in our interest that we redefine the future of collective bargaining system and recalibrate it. There's one thing that, that I that I find very interesting and very progressive. Now we've got two unions from two different federations. They are camping at union buildings. They demand 1,000 salary increment, finish and clear. They don't want 4%, 7%, whatever percent. They want 1,000 rand salary increment. Two unions from two federations. Now the employer is in the corner in a tight corner. The, um, under normal circumstances, the employer would say, we are offering 4% or 5%. The employer is now dancing to the tune of the unions. The unions say 1,000 rand, employer is saying 850. For the first time, the employer is negotiating salaries in monetary terms, not in percentages. So that thing is very progressive. You know why I say it is progressive? When there's an increase in electricity, they will say one unit of electricity is going to increase by 123 cents. They don't say 0.4% or whatever. When a, next, next week, when petrol is increasing, they say it will increase by 3 rand, finish and clear. They don't say 0.7%. But oh, now why are we paid in percentages? When we don't work for percentages, we work for money. Why is it difficult to say I'm going to pay you, give you a salary increment of 1,200 or 1,500? If, if Sibanya Steel Water has fallen in, in, into the trap or, or, or has taken the bait, they are no longer negotiating in percentages. Sibanya Steel Water now is saying uh, we are offering 850. We must push all the unions the government included, uh, I, I mean all the, the employers, the government included, to negotiate in monetary terms going forward. If we do that, we will not have this reneging of uh, agreements by employers. Government is the largest employer in this country. So if the largest employer has the, the audacity to renege on a collective agreement, what about the other smaller employers? They are going to follow suit. So from now on, we need to redefine the future of collective bargaining system and say we negotiate in monetary terms. NUMSA did it last week at Arcelomittal. They negotiated 6% salary increment and they said we want 5,000 rand cash graduate. The employer agreed. As simple as that. So this thing of 4% inflation, what, 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 related? No, let's do away with that. 
Let's do away with that. We are, we are working for money. We demand money. Finish and clear. The employer doesn't agree. We go to the picket line. We, we do for 30 years. They go home with a bottle of whiskey. Just like that. The federations are here. They, 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 they are not uh, delving into matters like this. You'll have one federation uh, debating uh, step aside instead of uh, debating workers, uh, workers' issues. The other federation almost collapsed the conference because the, the workers were arguing about credit card. <laughs> so it is an, an indictment on us. Those, those workers that are not unionized, it is our fault. It is our fault as trade unions. It is our fault as, as, as federations. We need to up our game. If we don't up our game, the employer is not there to, to take care of our needs and to, to help us up our game. So this thing, it depends on us. We, we, we have only 23% of workers that belong to unions. Only 23%. It's not even a quarter of the, 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 the general workforce that belongs to trade unions. Who's organizing the rest of the 77%? The rest of the 77% that are not organized, if we don't organize them, Rona, as trade unions, as federations, they are going to be organized by thugs. And the thugs are very effective. They don't waste time. But, but, but they don't allow for a vacuum. When they see a vacuum, they will close it. You can't be sitting here and, 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 and saying we are trade unions, we are federations, we are blah, 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 but we have 77% of the workforce. It's a Mayan fella Mumoyen that belongs nowhere. It's like when you are a parent, when, when you are a parent and your child says, no, mama, papa, no, papa, don't worry about raising me, I will raise myself. It's an indictment on us. Those 77% of the workers, why can't they trust the trade unions? What is it that they have seen? Or what is it that they, they have had? In conclusion, uh, we, this is the, 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 the final conclusion now. I, I said I will police my time. <laughs> I said I will police my time now. My, my time is about to end. Uh, Madam Speaker, in the past, we, we, used to have, we, we used to have trade unions. I know the comrades will, will look at me uh, differently when I say this. We used to have trade unions. Now, we, we no longer have trade unions. We have shifted from trade unionism to state unionism. In the past, we used to have NUM as one of the biggest trade unions, followed by NUMSA, Textile Workers Union. Those were the unions which were operating in the private sector, very large unions in the private sector. Now, all three leading federations, COSATU, FEDUSA, uh, what is the other one? Naktu. All three of them, when you check who's the, the largest union in Kosatu, you have Nehau. Nehau is representing public servants. A public servant union is the largest union in the Kosatu Federation. When you go to Fedusa, you have PSA followed by Naptosa. Both are representing public servants. In, in Saftu, Saupu is the second largest. It is representing public servants. The unions that are representing private sector workers are shrinking every day. That is why I'm saying we are gravitating towards state unionism, where the largest unions are those representing state employees or government employees. And if we are a country that says we want to industrialize on a massive scale, 
we, we must lock ourselves inside a dark room and discuss this thing of state unionism. How did we arrive at a point where public sector unions are the largest across all federations? What kind of a state are we building? We need to build an economy that is based on industrialization. So if the, 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 the largest unions are unions that represent public servants, then who's going to work in public sector? If we can't build our public sector to make it a very massive uh, private sector, then the economy is, is not going anywhere. We are not going anywhere as, as, as a country. Chairperson, uh, I will end there. My time has ended. I wanted to go further, but uh, the, my policing of my time says I must retreat. So thank you very much. Uh, thank, thank you very much. That, our, that was our last uh, presenter. Uh, the job that I was uh, uh, given to do today ends now. Uh, the speaker will be doing that. Uh, the re actually, will be uh, handling the two last items together. In the absence of the MEC for finance, the speaker will take up that space when she delivers her closing remarks and a vote of thanks. Uh, from where I'm seated, I would like to convey my words of gratitude for your patience and your cooperation from the beginning until now. So over to you, Speaker. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you, Ntatemokos. Uh, job well done. Uh, you excelled. If I were to appraise you, you were going to get 10 out of 10. Thank you. Um, honorable members, yes, of course, honorable members. Um, first, let me um, uh, convey uh, an apology for the MEC for Finance. She was hoping that at least by 2 o'clock we shall have completed our business. Uh, she, had, she even showed me that she has a meeting with National Treasury and some of the municipalities in our province because you've raised a number of issues yourselves today about uh, 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 municipalities. So she had to leave and, and attend uh, that meeting. Unfortunately, it was physical because I even asked, can't you go out, log in? And she said, no, 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 the people came from national. They are in the province. But what we said we are going to do for the part where she was not here, when the presentation were, 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 were made, we are going to send her that information so that the responses she was going to give will be given to us and then will dispatch to, to the offices of the, of, the, of the federations. But that is not the response as yet uh, that we want because moving from here, what we want is an action plan uh, that, that, that we are going to put in place for us to say, okay, we are grouping these issues that have been raised, very important issues Municipality presentation was traumatizing, I don't want to lie. It's very traumatic. Uh, not, not to say other, 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 other issues were, 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 were less sensitive, but municipalities are at the cold face of, of service delivery. So when you hear the things that were presented here, it gives you worries and it makes one lose hope. Because if we are unable, our constitution for that matter places development at the uh, uh, municipality level, at the local government level. So if we cannot get municipalities right, then it means we are in trouble. So what we are going to do is to group uh, uh, um, uh, uh, these issues as we are going to come up with our program of action so that we categorize them, which ones that we are going to, uh, uh, maybe myself, 
interact with the Premier? Which ones are we going to send to portfolio committees so that when the departments come, we'll be able to say, why is the police station that was renovated in 2017 not completed by now? Because I should think that that has been in the APP and the budget has been reflecting that. So maybe the portfolio committee has missed that part. So we must be able to say to the portfolio committee, look into this matter. So I'm just making an example to say we need to categorize the issues that have been raised. Others are of national uh, competence. We must be able to say to the Premier, you are sitting in the PCC Presidential Co Coordinating Council. Isn't it possible that these issues that we know that you cannot be able to tackle them at this level, can't you elevate them, spark a debate coming from Free State? This is what workers are saying from the Free State at that level where the premiers and the presidents are, 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 are meeting to be able to look into those matters, issues of netlag that were raised so that they can be elevated uh, 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 to, that, to that level. A lot has been raised, and some of the issues are not new, although some, having been uh, in Sadu uh, uh, myself, I'm surprised that there are even the policies that have been reversed. I didn't know that the rural uh, um, incentives policy is a policy, right? Uh, I wonder what stages did it take for that policy to be reversed. Because we, 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 we are concerned as a legislature. Remember we said uh, one of our core functions, we are a law-making institution. When these laws have been made, for us is to ensure uh, we are the custodians of the laws. It doesn't augur well with us when some of the laws, or even though the policies don't necessarily come here, but the policies should go a particular route. There should be consultation at the uh, ELRC in your case to be able to say we are going to do away with this policy for these reasons so that you can be able to, to start the negotiating a, a, a process at that level, at the ELRC in the province. So if that did not happen, then it means something went wrong. With other laws that we are picking up, that in terms of the application, uh, uh, somewhere, somehow, the laws that are made by these houses, remember, those, those are the laws that come here, most of them, as Section 76 bills, that we go out there and conduct public participation. We come here and get the conferral uh, uh, mandate, and we send to national, the law gets passed. It can be correct that the laws will just be uh, 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 amended outside the process that we have just mentioned. So those are the areas that we, we, we have to look into. If it is a matter of a province, we are going to pick up and we'll be able to say how do, where do we then direct our response as the custodians of the law. Remember, remember as the legislature, we are the lawmakers. We become the custodian. The executive arm of the state are the executors of the law. And the, the court are the interpreters of the, they interpret the law. Uh, I don't want to get to that part of taking the, 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 the abortion of the collective agreement to court and, and, and you close your, 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 your whatever recourse as the workers. I won't get there, but the judiciary is responsible for the interpretation of the law. So we are going to make sure that where the laws have been violated, we need to get an explanation as the legislature. We need to get an explanation. We, 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 we will see which stakeholders, as the legislature, we can interact with anyone in the province, be it from the private sector or any state entity. So as I said, it when we sit down, uh, uh, the, the, the task team, which will be, will be led by the by the um, manager in the office of the speaker, will be working with the representatives from yourselves so that it's not our own thing. We have done that with the traditional leaders dialogue. We started that in 2020. We, we started that, that process 
uh, 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 of, of engaging, and we, we, we realized that there were so many issues. So what we did, out of these platforms, whether it's a dialogue or parliament, we take those issues, we put them into an action plan, we form a task team which is going to uh, uh, involve the representative of uh, that sector so that we, we, we go through this process together. So that next year when we meet, we don't come again and lament and, 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 and uh, uh, do all those things without necessarily showing pro progress. But we do not have to wait for next year, May, for us to hear progress. We must be able to say this one was, was raised like this, this is how we have dealt with it, or this is the response we have, we have received. Uh, 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 from the from the um, uh, 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 responsible people. Oh, the issue of it's, it's 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 a worrying factor. The issue of non-payment of um, the third parties, because that thing is a serious injustice. Because when. The, 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 the money for my pension is deducted for me and is taken to a pension. When it gets there, that money gets invested so that when the, 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 the person uh, uh, retires, your money would have increased. Now, if that money is not paid at all, even if you can uh, increase the contract of that person, it's not going to serve that person anything. It means that person, after that, will have to go and get the, the 2,000 rand sasa unnecessarily. Oh, this matter has been raised so, 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 so many times. But at least I, I think we need to find a solution to it. We need to find a solution to it as a province. And we need to work together. So as and when uh, the manager in the office of the speaker uh, uh, approaches you to say, send people who are going to help, let us now develop a working document out of these issues so that we can move forward. Please let us all uh, 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 respond as such. We... we, we in South Africa, we, we, we say we, we are having a, um, uh, we, or rather we are building a developmental state. We even go uh, deeper to say, uh, because most the developmental state started in Japan after the, 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 the World War II, and it was in 1989 when the term developmental state came about after a scholar, Chalmers, went to research how did Japan had that boom after the collapse uh, uh, of the economy uh, because of the, of, the, of, the, of the World War, World War II. And then other countries, Taiwan, Singapore, uh, North Korea, adopted that model. And, and then it was referred to as a developmental state after that research was done. And you'd go to Scandinavian countries, they've embarked on a developmental state focusing on agriculture. These other Asian countries, they focused on industrialization and China focused on technology. But what are we focusing on as South Africa? Because we cannot say we're building a developmental state from a vacuum. So that, I think that is where our problem is. We must be able to have something that we are putting our finger on to say this is what we are we are going to, uh, to use to move forward without getting deeper into that uh, 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 debate. But I think uh, somewhere, somehow, when you think of the rate of unemployment that we are experiencing, and we are saying if we are a developmental state, building a developmental state for the past uh, a decade or so, why are we not moving? What is it that we are not doing correct for us to be able to get there and end up having a situation whereby the fiscals will shrink? And the, when the fiscals shrink, then we have workers complaining about the issues of collective bargaining not being respected because I think that is where the source is. Uh, having said all of that, um, 
I want to, to take an opportunity to thank you, all of you, for your participation. I'm sure it's the first time you find yourselves under one roof and uh, you are sitting in a way that uh, uh, the members in parliament are sitting and I don't want that you to have that mentality. I was expecting you to be mixing, you know, have stuff to this side and cosa to this side, just mixing, so that you don't sit like uh, uh, the opposition uh, uh, like this because you must refuse to adopt that pos position of opposing one another because in my view, you are representing Basebezi. In my view, when we talk about collective uh, bargaining, it affects whether you belong to a COSATU affiliate or to a SAFTU affiliate. If you are talking about the traffic co officers that do not have uniform, whether that traffic officer belongs to SAFTU or to COSATU, you will have something to say and uh, uh, boldly so moving forward. This platform has been launched to happen annually so that we can be able to see how far it can take us. We all want to better our province. We all want to better the, 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 the conditions of the working class. We all want to better the, 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 the conditions of service of our, of, of, our, of our people. So I think it is possible. The working class have a history in the world. You'll remember how Lenin overturned the Tsarist system in Russia, I mean in the, in, the, in, in, in the Soviet Union by that time. It was through the workers. He led workers, successfully so, to establish a socialist state in Russia. I don't want to get into politics. This podium does not allow me, but the context is that where there is unity, the working class can get up and be able to pursue things. We have struggled before, and things have happened before in the best interest of the workers and our, our communities. I want to thank you. Uh, thank you, Program Director. The session is urgent.